Hello. Hey, what's up? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you fine. Oh man, are you How's excited? How's it going? I'm, it's going I am awesome, stoked. Dude. Good. Do you have, do you, I'm just curious, did you, I'm not going to make you play it or anything. Do you have that conversation and that uh, heated taxi ride that you had with the Iraqi Christian dude? Oh shit, let me find that. Got it. I, see, I haven't even checked if the recording worked. You know, I have these conversations all the time in Uber. Ubers. You just get into Ubers and you ask people about like refugee status? Uh, I don't know, that seems <laughs> well, kind of... Well, the thing is... You know, it's a thing. Most Uber drivers are Middle Eastern. That's just a thing in Toronto. And I tend to ask them, where are you from? Like, what? why did you leave? You know, and Damn. 99% of the time, it's... So you're saying that you're taking... And Islam sucks. You're, you're <laughs> taking advantage of Uber, and you're saying that the reason why Uber is able to provide you the service is because immigrants have come in to fill in these jobs? That's a very interesting position to start off the debate with. <laughs> hmm. Oh, there are plenty of uh, Canadians that could take those jobs. Believe me, take a look at Alberta. But, uh... No, I, I do like the knowledge I get from these Uber drivers, certainly. And a lot of them are uh, half-decent people, and I mean... Damn, not only half-decent? Holy <laughs> shit. Do they, do they lose the other and half? And I certainly or... don't like... I certainly don't like the amount of taxes they're taking from me. But let me see if I can find this uh, for you. Sure. Last night I was having an interesting one with this guy who was telling me he was horrified to... Uh, come out to his family as wanting to be Christian. He said he would rather tell his family he was gay because he was so afraid. He was like, back in my country, they'll kill you if I come out as Christian. I'd rather come out as gay. Um, is it Islamic well, family, Don't of they course. live in Canada? Yeah, so I was, t I, was tell I was trying to tell him that. I'm like, dude, you live in Canada. They're not going to kill you. And he's like, yeah, but I'd be shunned from my family forever. I wouldn't be able to see my child, all this stuff, you know? I feel like if I came out to my parents as Islamic, I'm pretty sure they would have shunned me forever, too. I mean, I have a hard time <laughs> believing there are a lot of Christians out there that would be okay with their children coming out as Muslim. I mean, I could be wrong, but... Probably not, but I don't think they'll uh, honor kill you. That's usually... Probably that, not, but they're probably not going to honor kill you one. in Canada, either. <laughs> I mean, I mean uh, that's questionable. We've had a few of those. Let me uh, quickly find if I have this recording, though, for you. Since you were uh, pretty adamant about it being shoot that never happened <laughs> it's <a> pretty extreme. <laughs> all right uh what was it to when i tweeted this out was it the 12th um i don't remember let's see do you think the refugees are like that the syrians were bringing in i i don't know i don't know because you know why people and here it's gonna it's a long conversation so i can send it to you or i can uh i'll find the specific part where he says exactly what i tweeted out and i'll tweet it to you after this debate because i don't want to play a 15 yeah no no it's fine it's fine i understand i'm yeah. kind of kneeling with you that's all it's not a it's yeah. not a big deal all right, so I, I listened to the first what is it i listened to the first uh maybe half hour of that prepping for lauren southern Oh thing. shit, <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be fucking, I, fuck, I knew I shouldn't have posted it. <laughs> you pranked yourself, man. No, but I listened to the first half hour of that. Uh, oh, you focused a lot on the economic side, and I gotta admit, I am not an economist. I don't think either of us are. Luckily, we both admit that. Well, but, but dog, the guy, you have a whole chapter on immigration on no, no, how no, no, it's no, no, a no, net no, negative no, no, no. on the economy. How could you say that? I, 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 dedicated, I dedicated about three pages to the economy, and the rest was about culture, but I'm happy to talk about uh, the economic side of things. Uh, your <laughs> so I want to talk about culture for most of this, quite frankly, but <sighs> if you want to talk about economics, I will give you uh, my quick argument. Certainly, I want to talk about your econ major 101 that you had on. Uh, his argument was basically, what was it? We must construct additional pylons, even if we have to import zerglings to do it. Uh, that's what I got from your guy. He was saying that, um, oh, I believe he compared human workers to a resource that was a natural resource we should let in that was at about 30 minutes that he said that Wait, which was you just, just you know that's true right that if you look at things i thought this was weird because you attacked this as a negative to like supply side like res um labor is a supply of the market right like that is absolutely true like work like labor and work is a resource that the market can take advantage of if you run out of it it's humans, really bad humans are uh, not exactly equivalent to resources so i put this i, I put my argument in terms that uh, you might understand. So, <laughs> Doug, you're 21 with <laughs> no, 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 no. econ degree. No, I no, think listen, I can listen, understand listen. most of what you say. I'll try my hey, hardest, but I'll try to hey, follow along. No, I okay? had fun. I made a StarCraft analogy. Don't get mad uh, yet. Okay. I made it a StarCraft analogy for you. <laughs> so in StarCraft, you and I don't play StarCraft, but I did my best here. Sure. There's a constant demand for labor. 
And furthermore, wages never change. No matter how many SCVs you have, the prices of SCVs never change. And furthermore, SCVs don't have to eat or have shelter or sleep or do any of the things that normal workers do. If they did, then in effect, you might be starving SCVs out of existence by making more of them. If you drove wages down too far, you might reach a point where you cannot hire any more SCVs. Or if you did hire more SCVs, you might find the possibility of your buildings falling down because the only SCVs you could find to work for you at those low wages would be subpar compared to the others. So this is what we're concerned about. At least this is what. Uh, okay, many but if you follow that, um, that, that, about. that very we're concerned same... about SCVs bringing into that we are bringing into the country are contributing to its collapse. Okay, but that and same not, sorry, an, an, that continue. same analogy you can follow in order to create a larger base and more command centers. You need more SCVs. Maybe you get to a point to where you have so much supply and so many SCVs that you are able to start promoting some of these SCVs to Marines or siege tanks because you have so many low skilled SCVs. You no longer need to dedicate a large percentage of your economy to working these menial jobs. The only way your bases ever grow in StarCraft is by creating more SCVs. I feel like this is the worst analogy you could have chosen to make this <laughs> argument. If you, you're, you're essentially arguing that you should create a base and have eight SCVs all game long, so th and then you never grow? I mean... Okay, okay. But this is the thing. First of all, I want to point out that there's no need for domestic order in StarCraft, because its only goal is to kill enemies. In real life, this plays out much different. If you think of immigrants as only resource-producing machines like SCVs, then th that theory works great. But immigrants are not SCVs, they are people, and people do all sorts of things beyond what they produce economically, some of which impact the economy, like crime or welfare usage. And speaking of welfare usage, how would you feel if the game offered you the opportunity of purchasing an SCV at the price of 25 minerals, but for every minute after that, you lost 35 minerals for every SCV that you purchased this way. You would be losing far more than 50 minerals than the 50 minerals you it are cost absolutely versus a normal correct. SCV. But what if there was a base in the corner of the map, and the only way that I could get to that base is to do a heavy investment in SCVs early on using welfare. So what I do is I end up investing a lot in those workers early on, and that allows me to expand my economy and float a command center to the corner of the map and then mine more resources there. And the only reason I was able to do it is because I made an initial investment in a labor force that allowed me to grow my economy to such a level that I was able to do that these are the arguments that i'm making right now these are arguments that the economist that you cited makes like he has an article where he talks about immigration being a net positive for society that there are drawbacks that immigration does hurt some member of societies but the, this is the problem that i have um is that i feel like the conversation should be about what can we do to mitigate the negative aspects of immigration and then what can we do to expand upon the benefits of immigration that should be the conversation that is the reasonable conversation this idea that immigration is a net negative or a net drain on the economy is an idea that's not supported by any leading economist, even the one that you cite in your book. Okay, okay. <laughs> Wait. Okay, I, I also want to point out this thing here. So um, we're also talking about, we need to talk about the culture aspect as well. Yeah, yeah. So okay, I minute. totally agree. But can we do the economic thing and then we'll go to the culture thing? I'm not saying that like I win. So what, I win the what if the only, no, 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 here. Okay, so imagine if someone said, uh, hey, send me 25 resources for every Zergling I produce and those Zerglings can build resources for you. Would you trust that person? What do Zerglings do to your base? What do they do to your culture? What do they do to your country? Destroy things? Yes, absolutely. And what if so the only way you could get labor was by letting Zerglings into your base? I mean, what if it was one Zergling for every 80 SCVs? I would take that trade. You would? Yes. <laughs> That's, what do you that's mean? Even case. in your that's native pop, you're acting like the, this is a bad dichotomy because your native population also has crime. You're making it sound like native workers are free from crime and that if you bring in labor via immigration, that's where all the crime comes from. That's absolutely not true. And in some places like Germany, you see that certain groups of refugees like from Syria actually have less overall crime than the native population. Now, that's not true of certain refugees like the ones that come from northern Africa, but there are groups that in general are pretty low crime. But even if you do bring in in some crime. This is why I I detested the skills. How, how do you know? How do you know it's one zergling for every 80 SCVs? You don't. You measure it. 
you, you measure it. If, if it ends up that you bring in certain people, like I would say that in Germany, I think there's a big problem with, from what I've read, I could be wrong, but it seems like there's a big problem with North African refugees. I don't know yes. what the fuck is going on, but those guys seem to have crazy unemployment yes. rates. And they seem, yeah. So there's a problem there. So identify it and fix now, it. Do, but, do you know how much, do you know how much crime has increased over uh, just the past year in Germany? Um, I'm not sure, but I know that it's decreasing. <laughs> it's increased 31.6%. Okay, but how much has the population increased? You did a video where you linked an article about how refugees were causing an increase in crime. But if you follow that article and read it, I don't remember if I tweeted this at you or not, the article actually stated that even though the amount of re uh, refugees coming into the country was increasing, the per capita crime was actually decreasing drastically. And that the majority of the crimes were property crimes and whatnot. And no, 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 no. Okay, let's look, at the, let's look at a recent report from the country's interior ministry in Germany. The data, I'm, I'm quoting this exactly, the data reveals that without migrants considered, crime rates in Germany would have remained roughly static since 2014, but in fact, the country recorded an extra 400,000, and that has increased significantly by now, crimes committed by migrants. So this stat by the interior ministry in Germany has said it would have remained roughly static. So I don't know where you're getting your stats from, but I was going by the article that, that you, you linked in your own video. The, Which the video? Oh fuck! <laughs> You're gonna do. Hold on, let's see if I. I'm giving it. you my stats right on the uh, right here. Um. <sighs> I know it's it sucks being put on the spot to find the exact thing you're quoting, but I I have to know what you're talking about in order to. <sighs> to All right. It. <laughs> okay, Lauren Southern, Rebel Media, dude. I'm not gonna be able to find this on the fly. I thought I tweeted this at you. Maybe somebody in my chat will find it. Um, there was a video that you did. Um, oh fuck! Is it this one? Is Europe doomed? I'm not gonna know exactly. I'm not gonna know exactly which thing I quoted right then. I'm going to have to see it. Sure. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try to find it. Um, I'll try to find it in a little so, bit, I so guess. But can, can, let's, folks... let's address, let's quickly address like where we stand on this argument, because I don't want to just go in. Yeah, sure. Gems of let's yeah, yeah, sure. I, let's I agree. Let's address I agree. like where we actually disagree. Yeah, sure. So what, what, what is your stance on immigration? Okay. So my stance is that immigration is a net benefit to society. I think that immigration brings good things, and I think that immigration can bring bad things. So I think that the goal of a government should be to enact a policy that capitalizes on the good things and mitigates the bad things. Okay. So my stance on immigration is that our current immigration process that we have right now in the West, uh, specifically in Europe, I mean, we have problems in Canada and America as well, but specifically in Europe, is uh, not just a net negative, but is actually culturally destroying some countries like France and Germany and certainly Belgium and places like Molenbeek and changing the entire fabric of a society to the point where if it continues this way and if birth rates stay the same, you may not even have the same Western democracies uh, you had in 50 years with the same Western values. So my biggest problem is Do you think that the Western values that we had 50 years ago were good Western values? I'm saying 50 years from now. Sorry. Maybe okay. you misheard me or well, I said it wrong. 50 no, years from I, now, I you heard you, but it just seems strange that, like, I don't think I want the country to be the same 50 years from now. There are things that I want to see change. I just thought that was Well, do you strange... want us under Sharia in 50 years from now? <laughs> Probably not, but I don't think that any major country is headed in that direction. You don't think Molenbeek is headed in that direction? I mean, I went there and I spoke to the people of Molenbeek and all the people living there. Did you speak to all of the people? And Holy shit, how many people did you speak well, the with? People, that must have taken all you years. All the people I spoke with there, okay, well, so, the people I spoke with there told me that the majority of people that live in Molenbeek want Sharia law. And if you look at the data of how many people want Sharia in uh, Britain, it's quite high. I mean, the statistics are pretty damning if you look at them. And I'm not talking right-wing Breitbart statistics. I'm talking BBC statistics. I'm talking left-wing stuff. Just the fact of who wants Sharia law, who supports radicalism. I, I mean, I can cite some for you if you'd like right now. I, I've, I've seen all the Pew Research <laughs> Polls. Okay, so you've seen the Pew research. You know that it's a majority of Muslims that do want Sharia across the world. Sure, but uh, I mean, a majority of Christians also want you to live under the Ten Commandments, which are pretty shitty as well. I mean, I, I think that the problem is that I feel like when, when you do this kind of polling like this... Well, I, they want you to, but Christians aren't forceful. It's not a political religion. It's a, they if used to be quite a while ago, dog, and we still have missionaries. Right, exactly, but you can go the mug Christianity, but that is not the problem we're dealing with right now. I mean, you can sure, continue I agree, to but what's, treat mug crusades, but right I'm now not, I'm we're not, dealing with radical okay. Islam. I'm just saying, like, it's a... <laughs> so this is my problem, okay, is that when I... When I when, when I want to have a conversation about these types of things, what I want is I want a productive conversation that moves us all towards talking about topics that will fix the problems that we have right now. The solutions that you, your side, seems to be offering are tell all Muslims to stop being Muslim or 
tell them all to convert? What, what is your solution? What are you offering here? My solution is certainly slow down immigration from Islamic countries where they are not assimilating and they're coming in uh, amounts where they're creating enclaves in areas and are not learning the languages, are not assimilating to Western culture. Okay, but what does this have to do with fixing like the Islam problem and shit? Fixing the Islam problem? Well, I don't know if there's much of a fix for that, but uh, <laughs> it, I, what do you mean? What does it have to do with fixing the Islam Christians, problem? If we stop Christians... letting tons of Islamists Im immigrate to our country, I mean, we're going to have a lot less problems with Islam, aren't we? Well, I don't Certainly know. Do you think, what, I mean, in 9-11, I mean, I mean, it seems like these problems can be imported from other places and it doesn't necessarily have to be through immigration. I mean, you, you can still have people sneaking into countries to commit terrorist attacks and whatnot. Why, okay, why okay, have Christians but... gotten so much better over the past few hundred years? They had a reformation. Islam has not had a reformation. Okay, why are Christians able to have reformations? It seems like a lot of this stuff is t tends to be centered around economic issues, right? And issues of political I mean, freedoms and whatnot, right? Like, if you what do you mean, why, why were Christians able to have a reformation? It, it, it seems like if you look at the Western world, Christians have done a lot better as, as they've become less fundamentalist. Would you agree with that and more secular, or do you disagree with that? Uh, can you, so they've become better as it becomes more secularist. Yes. And less like fundamentalist. Do you, do you agree or disagree with that? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know, honestly, if I agree. Are you, did, I'm that. not trying to um, stickle you. Are you religious or were you raised religious? I'm, I, I was raised in a religious home, but I'm, I'm honestly, I, I haven't been particularly religious for a long time, but I've been attending mass lately just because I'm curious. Are you familiar with things like the book of Deuteronomy or any of the older, like Old Testament I, books? I read the, have... I grew up, uh, I grew up reading the Bible uh, and I don't necessarily agree with everything that's in it. I Certainly have my critiques, but I also think how people practice their religion in the real world and politically matters. And I think that oh comparing Islam to Christianity uh, is okay, dude. I totally kind of agree with what you just said. That was a hundred percent. That was so beautiful, Lauren. So Christians all around the world practice Christianity in different ways, right? Not every single Christian is a fundamentalist Christian, right? Especially when you move west, people tend depends to depends what you mean by fundamentalist. N no, it, well, it doesn't. I mean fundamentalist and what a fundamentalist means. Somebody that follows the letter of the book, right? Very few Christ Christians in the West follow the letter of the law in the Bible, right? In fact, I think a majority of them haven't even read the Bible, to be fair, right? Sure. Okay, so. It seems like there are also millions and millions in the United States alone. I think there are three million Muslims. That's a lot of Muslims that also don't obviously don't follow their holy books to the letter of the law. Right. Because the way that people practice their religion is very unique to a particular culture, to a particular society, even down to a particular neighborhood or depending on what church. No, you no, go no, no, to. no. Islam is far more homogeneous than Christianity. Far then more why are the three million Muslims in the United States not causing massive riots and terrorist attacks and blowing places up all the time? Well, they don't necessarily. Well, they're first of all. America has a more comprehensive immigration system than Europe right now, which is just freaking open borders. And you've got the Eastern Mediterranean and African uh, routes going just blown the okay, fuck wait, open. But I'm right asking now, about the United States. Through. Whereas in the United States, we have United three States? million Muslims. Why are they not all committing terrorist attacks if they're this homogenous oh. society that you just said they were? They, okay, why are they not all committing terrorist attacks? First just, of all, you, you've had terrorist attacks in America happening. We have and three all, million Muslims, though, dog. I'm not talking like one every few months. We have three million Muslims. These guys should be causing a riot like all the time. There should be terrorist attacks on I'm, the daily. I'm not, my, argument, my argument isn't that, is, is not that Muslims are creating terrorist attacks every day. My argument is that once you get Muslims in cultural enclaves, they vote for more laws like Sharia, and they try to create Sharia in these enclaves, and eventually create communities that are unlivable for native populations. Take a look at Mark Slow in Germany. Take a look at, um, ah, what's it, where's Tommy Robinson from? Can't remember exactly uh, where Tommy Robinson from, but these small towns, Luton, Luton in uh, England, these small towns have become unlivable. In America, you don't quite have that problem yet because there isn't the same mass amount of Muslims that have become enclaved in certain areas. They only bring in a, a certain amount and make sure they have a mixing pot immigration system. And I'm not, my argument is not that every Muslim is creating terrorism. My argument is that they create cultural enclaves and eventually bring in Sharia and eventually bring in their political ideology, which causes a lot of problems and tensions and language issues. And eventually places like Molenbeek, where you have a large majority of the population who not, they aren't necessarily committing these acts, but they certainly agree with them. 35% of Muslims in Britain believe that suicide bombings 
are justified. 42% in France, 22% in Germany, 29% no, 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 in Spain. I don't care Spain. about these polls, dog, because I guarantee, you because what? you could pull Christians in- How do you in, not care? Because, because people that think that, how many uh, Americans could you pull that think that sometimes civilian deaths are okay as a result of bombing things, right? You can find a lot of like polls that say things like this. But again, like the fact- No, 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 this is suicide bombings. This is- Okay, well, it's suicide matters, bombings dog, come on, who cares? Yes, no, it why does. Does it yes, matter? it does matter. Okay, when you're you're saying you could find polls of Americans supporting bombing things, we're talking about them bombing ISIS. Yeah, you could find people saying civilian deaths are okay if we're killing a large ISIS. What about if we talk about America supporting Israel that bombs hospitals and bombs schools, dog? It doesn't matter if it's a suicide. You know they bomb hospitals and schools because terrorist organizations in Palestine put their freaking weapons there. They no one. Do you think Palestinian sick people and children care about that? Do you think that a Palestinian well, child or the family of a Palestinian child? Israel care about that. But dude, they don't, the bombs don't make, the little shitty fucking RPGs don't even make it over the walls because Israel is one of the most sophisticated anti-missile dome systems in the fucking world. You're really comparing the military power of these two states? Come on, dude. No, 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 no. Okay, I'm not, I'm not. I'm saying the reason they're not just sitting there bombing hospitals and schools. You can't honestly believe they're just sitting there like, you know what? Let's fucking bomb a hospital. Israel today. has I, literally been on record manufacturing not... reasons in the past <laughs> to march into the West Bank and fucking okay. exterminate people, dog. What do you okay, mean? Okay, okay, listen up, listen up. I am not a huge, I, I barely talk about the Israel-Palestine conflict. I am not I, one to run around and be like, Oh, I love Israel. I love Israel. But I, I certainly am not also going to sit around here and pretend that they are bombing hospitals and schools for shits and giggles. At least admit that you have terrorist organizations that specifically set up their weapons places and their attack places in hospitals and schools simply to get Western media's attention. At least admit that. Yeah, sure. They probably do. Okay, there you go. Thanks. So you're. That doesn't mean I'm okay with bombing hospitals and fucking schools, though. <laughs> Damn. Whoa. That was like, we they crossed that bridge real bombing, fast. They are bombing terrorist. Okay, okay. This is off the topic of immigration, but my point <laughs> is that I, I don't even know how we got here. I'm not necessarily okay with bombing hospitals and schools, but when you have terrorist organizations setting up, uh, <laughs> setting up their weapons and bombs there, you know what? They're, it's a little different than them just doing it for shits and giggles. So at least we can agree on that. Sure. Okay. Let's back up a lot. Okay. Because we got off track, okay? Let's back up to the, um, I want to focus <laughs> on the economic argument, and then we can move on to the social stuff so that we don't get too sidetracked, okay? No, no, no. I, I, like I said, I think we got over our economic. I, I like the culture. I like the culture okay, okay. stuff. So, that, that's what okay, so then I just, I, just so that I can hear you say it, to, to put my own mind at ease, do you agree that sure. with the right policy that you can mitigate enough of the economic aspects of immigration to make them net positives, to be a consistent net positive to Western economies? Do you agree with that? That with the right, so that means that I would be in favor. I think that in places like um, Sweden and maybe even a place like Germany, maybe the welfare state is a little bit too generous, especially for newly coming laborers, right? Maybe you scale back on some of that a little bit, but that with the right policy, I think that immigration, and I mean, Germany just had, you know, record breaking GDP things for the, over the last five years, right? I think that you can argue that immigration can be a net positive to society and economically in the long run, right? Do you agree with that? Or, or, you would need a hell of a lot of changes, a hell of a lot of changes. The first thing, and I think uh, even the economist you were talking to mentioned it, is that right now the amount of uh, money and work and labor that immigrants are bringing in does not make up for the amount of welfare they are consuming, and that has been proven true time and time again. I can well, cite plenty of stats for you if well, you'd like. What do you mean that's been proven true time and time again? Okay, well, let's... Yeah, let's talk about uh, the Center for Immigration Studies, who have shown that welfare usage compared to native houses, n native households in America, to immigrant households. Overall, 30% of native households uh, on some form of welfare and 51% of immigrant households. When it comes to Asians, uh, it's 22% of natives, 33% of immigrants, 23% white, 35%, uh, 23% white natives, 35% uh, white immigrants and Hispanic, even just for natives, it's 54% <laughs> native households, 70% immigrant households. So you, you have to look at um, the amount of Medicaid they're using, the amount of all the food stamps they're using is just disproportionate to the native households right now. One, if you can level that out to the same amount as native households, or in fact, I think it should be less. I think that we should be accepting immigrants that 
aren't coming into the country to go on welfare, then yeah, sure, it could be certainly be a benefit. Okay, but so the problem with a lot of these studies is that they don't address the complete economic impact. Like they'll you'll stop and say something like, well, you know, these people might use a little bit more welfare, but then you don't follow that money, right? Well, does that welfare end up being an ultimately a stimulus on the economy? You know, do maybe the fact that these people exist in these areas and cause more demand in this economy cause these things to, to balance out? Um, that particular thing that you're talking about, um, I hate to fucking cite them, but the Cato Institute had a, had a problem with what you're talking about, right? Um, the Cato Institute? Okay, what, what did they say? Um, it, it, if, you re <laughs> if you read the article, basically it's that they don't analyze enough where the, where, where the money goes and that the problem is that the, um, the, the welfare reliance of these immigrant populations are dramatically like over exaggerated. Um, I like the article. In They're Skype. dramatically over exaggerated. Okay, we'll send that over. Let's see. Is it a because the um, the immigration studies that I'm citing from the Center for Immigration Control, they sent them over to a third party to make sure that they were fair and they they have been reviewed. OK, sure. and I can cite other ones so, in Canada. In Canada, we cost it's about six thousand dollars per immigrant. Uh, for a total annual cost, and it's somewhere between 23 billion annual cost, and that that's the cost for the immigrants living here. So we are not getting a net gain from immigrants. This is just well, but just, just the because cost that's a here. cost and doesn't mean you're not getting an. They're sending around 24 billion in remittances out of Canada. So a lot of the money that they make when they come here, they're sending out of the freaking country as well. Okay. That goes for America as well. But when you, when you do these comprehensive immigration studies and whether or not they're a net gain or a net drain on your society, you can't just look at one variable. Like, well, they're they not send looking a lot at one of... variable. Okay. If you you know, it's a quite a long study, and I've listened to the alleged debunkings of them as well. I mean, there's a lot... The, look at the Fraser Institute report. I'll send it over after. It's a fascinating study. It's quite long to read, but um, they, they did a debunking of it with a few professors from Simon Fraser University. Turns out the debunking of their study, the only thing they could pull out of their asses was they instead looked at immigration statistics from 50 years ago, which of course are quite different populations coming into the country. So Fraser Institute went back and debunked that one. So these studies are quite comprehensive. Even the debunkings of them that I have read have done very little to uh, prove them wrong. I'll send them over. I'd suggest reading through them. But you saying that there is no proof that immigrants are a net drain on the country, I think, is ridiculous. I mean, most of the reading that I did to prepare for this was of the economist that you cited in your book who agrees that immigration has been a net gain for the Western uh, for the entire Western world and every leading, I guess I would have to dig harder. I don't know if you're getting these reports from Breitbart. Borjas? But you're talking about Borjas? Yes, yes. That every the single last complaint is with immigration is that it decreases uh, wages, the price of labor. Sure, which it does. To, but, and to and what, what, what are you saying? He's saying that supports you. <laughs> Borjas claims that while it causes decreases in um, while it causes de while it uh, while it causes decreases in the wages of the laborers that are directly impacted, that there are other benefits that can be measured as a result of laborers moving into a country. So, for instance, if you have a lot of laborers that move into a job market and they compete with certain laborers, those people might have the opportunity to move into complementary positions. Or, because these um, immigrants are moving in, um, they cause demand for more products, which causes other industries to go, which those people that are displaced can then take up jobs in. That there's a really complicated ecosystem when you have people moving in that causes, you know, labor to shift around and that markets will respond accordingly. I, I don't think I don't think you read Borjas properly. You can't just like what you were just saying, you can't look at one variable like labor prices. I, that's why I just talked about things like demand and whatnot as well, like demand for housing or demand for products or the fact that businesses will move in to take advantage of new labor, causing more opportunities to exist for other people that live there already. OK, OK, I'm going to check this article you sent over. So the Bor Borjas's point is, I think it would actually, you're right, he does have points that agree with both of us, but he says basically his main argument is the immigration system has both costs and benefits that need to be fixed. I think we can agree on that. Yeah. So immigration is not perfect right now by far. And I'm going to read that quick thing you sent over. Sure. Can I read you a quick sentence? Tell me if you agree or disagree with this. The influx sure. of immigrants can potentially be a net good for the nation, increasing the total wealth of the population. Do you think that that statement can be true? They could be with a very hawkish immigration policy, and I think that's uh, his point. And I'm for a hawkish immigration policy, which is what we're debating on right now. Okay, but the, the, this is the problem that I have. It's the same problem that Borjas has, okay? Is that 
I like I wish that these arguments could be framed in such a way that we are moving towards having productive arguments on what to do with immigration. Um, so, for instance, in your book, you cite the term reactants, right, as people wanting to do the opposite of whatever it is they're told. That's what I see your right. entire movement as. When you have people on the left arguing that immigration causes no negative benefits whatsoever, or I'm sorry, no negative drawbacks whatsoever, which is stupid, and then you have people like you on the right arguing that we need to, like, get rid of all immigration and immigration is ruining everything and is a net drain, like, how do you have a reasonable conversation, right? And then you have an article posted by Borjas where he talks about how both sides are skipping are telling different stories, right? This article literally says the candidate. Well, okay, so, right. right, right. I see. I see your point. I see your point. And you know, it is. It's a reaction to uh, what our politicians are like. I live in Canada, uh, okay. where we have politicians that, quite literally, on a daily basis, when questioned by liberals like Bill Mayer, we had our currently one of our. Uh, oh, she's not Senate. Um, Christia Freeland, one of our government representatives, on Bill Mayer's show, talking about immigration, and Bill Mayer challenged her and asked her. What do you think about bringing too many Islamists into your country? What do you think about Islam? Do we have a problem with Islam? And Christia, a representative for the Canadian government, literally went, she, a minister, she went into hysterics, just yelling, diversity is our strength, diversity is our strength. And that is the repeated argument we hear over and over again from sure. our institutions, so then, from our your... government. And yes, the reaction is, no, diversity is not our strength. No, these are all the problems. So, so is your goal yes... to be just as retarded as the opposition? Is that your <laughs> life goal? Because no, the, it's... Because it's to, it's I find to it funny other, because it's to present the other argument but why that do you is have currently to do not being presented up, in popular culture. But why do you have to Sorry, do that I, by taking up the most extreme anti-opposition side? Why can't what, you be what's extreme? I don't see myself as what's extreme. Chapter extreme. four, whatever in your book is named, immigration is literally ruining everything. Okay, well, clearly I'm being a little hyperbolic for kicks and giggles. I mean, I think you could tell that. The next I mean, chapter I say, is called I Islam is literally ruining first. everything. Yeah, yeah. And I said how I'm literally ruining everything. Of course, it's being hyperbolic. And I think anyone with half a brain can tell that. So I mean, is Breitbart not... hyperbolic? Is Alex Jones hyperbolic? Is Rebel Media hyperbolic? Do you see, is Trump hyperbolic? Do you see these problems well, I don't like... think we're. I don't think we're nearly as hyperbolic as Trump is literally Hitler. I mean, you don't see us running around calling Angela Merkel literally Mao. Like it's, uh, it's I've not... seen some. If you go on the poll boards, you can see some pretty funny shit about Angela Merkel, dog. We're getting raped by Muslims and loving it and the BBC and the cock. That, even you use the word cock now in your book like i don't okay, well, know what's wrong with using the word cucked i uh, cucked is a political description of people now if you uh, if you're okay with immigrants coming into your country and destroying it simply to say diversity is our strength yeah that's a little cucked <laughs> i mean i don't think that's hyperbolic i think it's hyperbolic to say trump is literally hitler i think okay my, well then uh, what if the, then, then that, then I, I think you can tell the difference between my hyperbole in this book and okay well I'm then that's what i say on the left then then every time somebody says diversity is our strength maybe they're just being hyperbolic did you ever think of well, that we maybe? know they're not because Why? they go into hysterics and start crying over it maybe that's see... their form of hyperbole dog okay okay we both know that's not true why not <laughs> like they do you Why see, but this is, see, this is the problem with political discourse these days, is you're willing to grant okay, your wait, wait, wait. side so many no, no, benefits. No, you're, you're, making, you're making false equivalences. You are equating poll on 4chan to political leaders at the moment. You're saying poll and Alex Jones are, are, should be equated as representatives just as equally as political leaders of countries. I'm talking about political leaders that we're opposing. Okay, and can I say Trump is then? as hyperbolic as them. Can I say Trump? Trump? Okay, Does he okay, count as a political leader now? Somebody that said yes. that three million illegals voted in our election? Somebody that says that vaccines cause autism? Somebody says that global warming is a hoax by China? So, I mean, like, I can go on and on about crazy hyperbolic... St but what, you're not supposed to take them seriously? Or sure, you're and you know what? Hyperbolic? No, 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 let me, let, me, let me reply to that. I don't mind people replying to Trump's hyperbole. I, don't, I, don't, I really don't mind when people correct Trump at all. I don't mind when people say, hey, Trump was wrong about that statistic. I don't mind at all. Okay, but these <laughs> like, are mainstream political people, and he has, like backing now right like i think that breitbart to some extent especially with its presence in in trump's political campaign and one i think you could argue that breitbart has become in a way some sort of mainstream media outlet there are a lot of people that look to them it's not of the same level of cnn or fox news or msnbc but like i think that these trump's, trump's main political argument is not that global warming is fake right now our liberals in canada main political argument is diversity is our strength they say it on a daily basis and put it in their press releases and it's in our education and it's in our textbooks, and it's taught constantly in our universities. What Trump is saying is something that is counter to what is mainstream culture. So when you talk about uh, mainstream, I'm not just talking about one political leader like Justin Trudeau. I'm talking about like the entire 
system is like that right now that we're opposing. Trump may make a few statements here and there that I'm happy with people correcting. But to compare that to an entire system that is currently quite left wing, uh, I think is a, a little ridiculous. Okay, so here's my problem, Doug. Five or six years ago, I was a pretty right leaning person. Okay, like really, yeah, believe it or not, Ron Paul <laughs> fanatic and everything. Okay, pretty libertarian. Okay, I, don't, I wouldn't call Ron Paul okay libertarian, not right. Sure. So, um, and even today, like I think economically, I I understand in theory a lot of right leaning ideas. Okay, but my problem is that today, if you are a sane individual, you cannot champion any right leaning politician because they're insane. Because they're of this mindset that the only way that we can exist is to take up the most entrenched opposite position of the opposition. So if somebody were to come up and say like, diversity is our greatest strength, right? My response would probably be something like, I don't know, I mean, diversity is nice and all and there are definite benefits, but I think we have greater strengths and I think that sometimes diversity can cause problems. So let's figure out how to mitigate the problems and expand on the, on, on the uh, benefits, right? And your position is, no, fuck diversity, it's ruining everything. Do you see the, like, do you see the problem My with, that, with that kind of political discourse and how that doesn't get anybody anywhere? Okay, well, you're, the problem is you're speaking from a point where currently the entire system of media, politics, and global finance agree with your political position. So, of course, you're going to see myself and others who oppose you as a little radical, a little crazy. Wait, did, wait I'm sorry. Say um, that, could you say that last part again? What did you mean by that? The, the entire system of media, politics, and global finance agree with your position. <laughs> But that, but not necessarily, because there are people that are more left leaning than me that I that I argue with. Like for instance, the Bernie Bros that believe that a fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage should be mandated across the country. Minimum wage is probably bad economic policy, and I acknowledge that. But I don't have anybody in my corner to sit there and defend that with me, because the people that do are also saying stupid shit like global warming is a hoax, and we need to teach creationism in schools, and also contraception needs to be taken away from fucking women. Like, damn, where are my allies? If I am a reasonable right leaning person, where do I go to find other reasonable people? It's not. It's reasonable people. It's not rebel media. It's not Breitbart. It's not Infowars, right? Wh who do I have in my corner to, to, to defend these points of view with me, right? Maybe I am pro-life. I am pro-life. I don't like abortion because I think it's murder, right? Well, who do I stand by there? It's going to be a guy with a fucking Bible saying God well, you're, hates you're, fags. You're, like, never, you're, you're never going to agree with people uh, entirely. It's not. No, 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 no. I'll tell you right now, Bernie bros are not exactly mainstream there the radical there's a lot of radical leftists okay sure um, but I'm, I'm not talking about not agreeing with everything i'm saying that i don't think a reasonably intelligent person can be a republican in the united states today and i would defend that opinion the republican I can say the exact same about leftists i mean but i don't Hillary agree but that's not true it's it's po i'm a left-leaning person and i'm very liberal or, or, I'm sorry, not very liberal. I'm very reasonable, okay? I'm pretty liberal. But I'm pretty reasonable, too, right? Like, I will tell you things that, like, I don't know if... It, like, there are a lot of Democrats that will say, like, a $15 an hour minimum wage probably won't work, right? And at least on things sure. like science, like, most people on the left seem to be in a, in, a re, in a reasonable realm where you can have debates with them. So, like... <laughs> right, except they think that you can have 72 genders, and that's totally reasonable. <gasps> They're really, okay. really what good mainstream on science, politicians right? <laughs> are talking about seventy two genders in the United States. Mainstream, what mainstream politicians. Politicians. Oh, if you ask a leftist politician oh, we just had in Canada, we just had Bill C sixteen passed where you now have to refer to people as their preferred pronouns. And I changed my gender to male this year or last year for shits and giggles. I am obviously not a male, but that was a thing that was passed by our politicians, our liberal politicians, that I should be allowed as a woman who walked in with heels, my hair down, and mascara on, I should be called a sir, and that should have legal backing behind it where people can be legally punished for not calling me sir. What? What? This is insanity, and this is all stuff that is pushed by the left. Okay. That mainstream Firstly, left. Firstly, th we're going into like some very niche psych areas here, okay? Which is. And of course, you've got IQ denialism. That's a really big one on the left. Okay. How about, how about senators in Congress throwing snowballs to say that things like global warming aren't real? How about the fact that the vice president. Okay, well, no, 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 no. My point isn't. I, I didn't even argue that there isn't science denialism. Okay, no, no, no. On the but right. when I talk about science denialism, you're pointing to the left as saying, like, well, they believe some things about psychology that are kind of weird. And I'm saying, well, the right is denying. kind of weird. Are you saying? Are you saying there are seventy-two genders out there, and that I am a man? Are <clears throat> you saying that's genders? Possible? No, but I don't. I'm kind of on. I don't know. I'm on the fence about transgenderism. I don't really know. Per, for me personally, because I'm not like a huge asshole, I don't see a big problem about calling somebody um, by their preferred pronouns. I don't really think that's a massive. Do you deal. think there should be legal backing behind calling me Zer? 
that I should be um, able to send you to jail for not calling me Zer. This or gets at least into finer points of law that I can't discuss because I don't know what Canadian law is like. I, I can't really get into it with you. I know no, that no, in no, the no, but this, this is something that is being pushed by leftists. In New York, you have this law. You'll yes, be charged and in New York, it makes sense. Yes, in New York, it makes Why? sense. Why does it make sense in New York? <sighs> Because in the United States, there are protected classes, okay? Things like gender, things like um, race, right? Uh, family status. And catkins, on... apparently. No, they're not catkins. That hasn't existed anywhere why, why in the United catkins? States. If I, if I want you we're to... not talking about catkins right now, Lauren. That no law has been passed in the United States about anything having what to do with catkins. What if my catkins. gender? What if my gender is catkin in New then York? Then you can go and then you can go and petition a judge or whatever to try and get that shit pass, okay? It's, no, 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 no. That's, that's, but... in, that's in New York no, right it's now. Not. I can be no, it's not. It's not in New York. Okay, maybe in Canada, but I'm talking about in New York. Okay, so in New York, the deal was that if you were an owner of a building or if you were an employer, you Sorry, were not 31 vendors. Okay, if you were the owner of a building and you had like tenants or whatever, or if you were an employer, you could not intentionally and maliciously misgender your employees over and over again or your tenants to harass them. That's what the bill was about, because the bill called in to protections things that fell under um, gender discrimination. That was the whole point of that bill. So that means, let's say that you get somebody that's literally a post-op transgender that has the boobs and the vagina and everything. No, and no, comes no, no, no. In. Let's say you get someone that goes into work and isn't a post-op transgender. Let's say I go into work and make my coworkers call me a him and a mister. That, who's the malicious person there? If that was happening en masse, then we could talk about that, but that's not what the bill no, was no, no, about. No, no, but that's, that's, what is, that's what is in place right now, legally, and it's, it's, it's a complete no. denial no, 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 of no, no, no. What, what, what is, is in place legally is to prevent employers, I'm telling you what the law said, is to prevent employers from discriminating against their employees on the basis of them being a transgender. So if somebody comes in and they said that I prefer to be called a she or whatever, and, and, and this is my name, and you intentionally call them, yo, what's up, Butch? Hey, Butch. Hey, Butch. Well, over actually, and over and over again. No, no, no. Butch, Butch is one of the genders on the New York City 31 genders list. So, What, what, is, what is this New York City 31's gender list? Oh, that, this, is, this is the genders that are protected under this law. You can force your coworkers to call you two spirited, butch, pan gender, femme queen, gender bender, non op, hedra, whatever that is, androgynous, person of transgender, femme person of transgender experience. Like, this is just ridiculous shit that you could be. I, that you could I don't know what you're talking about. You. I had a two hour but, conversation with a lawyer that specializes in representing minorities, and he didn't bring any of this up. So I'm very hesitant okay, to Okay, here, I'll send you the is... article. I'll send you the article right now. Sure. Um, but basically, the idea behind that law was to prevent um, creating hostile work environments. Was the point of was the entire point of that law, which I, I don't see as being like this inherently negative thing. I I think <laughs> first of all, I think you should be able to hire and fire whoever you want, and I think you should be able to call your workers whatever the okay. hell you want because if they you, are able to quit. If you agree with want. that, that's fine. But that's not a, that's not how America works, and that is an un-American idea. But if you no, think that okay. what? Liberty and having the ability to run your company how you want is an un-American idea. The idea that you I'm can be discriminated sure. on the basis of a protected class, yes, is an un-American idea. No, no, no. Idea. The idea of a protected class is an un-American idea. Okay, well, that's and not also what gender, our, that's gender not what our is not. Also, also, just so you know, gender is not a protected class. Sex is. You have the law wrong. Oh, my bad. Sex, not gender. <laughs> okay, my, you got me there. See, I should have known that. But in the United States, we, we, we have made the decision in the past legally to disagree with you. So, I mean, if that's what you think, that's fine. I mean, we could talk about the reasons why protected classes exist if you want. But in, I'm telling you that by law in the United States, we disagree. No, no, in New York right now. No, in the United States, there are protected classes. If you are renting a building, you cannot discriminate on certain things. You cannot tell somebody they can't come just because they're a woman or a man or just because they have kids or just because of their uh, race. And I think maybe religion might be protected. I'm not sure. But I know that those three for sure are. You can't discriminate on that basis because in the United States, the Supreme Court has decided that that's not allowed. That's how America works. I don't know in Canada. Canada might be different, but these are what we've decided as Americans on how our legal system works. That's what your Supreme Court has decided. I don't agree with that. I okay. don't think it's an American so, principle, and I don't think it was originally an American principle either. It definitely um, is an American principle because the problems you run into when you allow people to discriminate on these bases is, is that you run into things like ghettoization, right? You run into things where you are shepherding or herding people into these specific parts of cities because... So you, you, they can Ooh, only exist you're... there because everybody is allowed to discriminate against them otherwise. Like that's that's not an ideal environment. When for you talking about wanting to increase um, cultural cohesiveness and I increase integration and assimilation into a culture, the last thing you want is for people to set up entire blocks okay, or districts. Okay, first of all, that that wouldn't that wouldn't happen naturally because people want 
freaking business to their company. They're not going to suddenly, no smart business is going to suddenly say, you know, I, I want to never serve women. I want to cut out 50% of the okay, earnings that on. I you could can't, get. Just seriously, the hold on. I'm, and wait, I, I need to correct you on something because you are saying that this is an American principle. It is not. This was not constitutional. Protected classes were made up by the Supreme Court, not by Americans. It is bullshit. It is a bullshit idea that this is an American principle. And as for ghettoization, like what happens when migration comes in? They cause far more ghettoization. If, if you're actually concerned about that, which uh, I, you kind of skipped over that, if you're actually concerned about ghettoization, you should be really concerned about migration because that's where most of the ghettoization is happening. Yeah, most of the ghettoization the happens when policies push people to live in certain areas because people like you think that it's okay to gentrify areas and push people that don't look a certain way into different areas oh, because that's the freedom oh, 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 of business owners. Where did owners. I say that? Where did I say these that? Are, they I all, these all follow the that. same kind of trend, the idea that you should be able to pick and choose who's allowed to do business in certain areas, right? First of all, everything that you're saying doesn't exist in American history. If what you're saying is true, that business owners will pick people and they wouldn't want not want to serve different people then things like Jim Crow in the 1950s 40s 30s and discrimination against black people none of this stuff should exist because everybody should have wanted black customers sorry your norms don't exist at all well, you're acting like if I go back to the 1900s I should be able to find business owners serving black people everywhere because they want to increase their consumer base that's absolutely not true and that's absurd to even suggest that there's there's been massive discrimination in the United States in the past against certain classes why do you think they're protected now? Why would we make these laws if people were already choosing to, to, to respect everybody and to just do what would maximize profits? Oh, no. wait, oh, sorry. Wait, can you hear wait, wait. me? First of all, I, I, yeah, I can hear you, sorry. Okay. Uh, I wanna mention that gentrification is an economic phenomenon, not a policy phenomenon. And also the, the world has changed a lot as of the current state it is in. In the current state it is in, and you if you suddenly got rid of uh, these freaking laws that were created by the Supreme Court, not by Americans. I don't think Jim Crow would come back. I don't think slavery would come back. And I think it is a little ridiculous to assert that. Okay, but it's, no, it's not ridiculous to assert that because depending on where you go in the South, it's very possible that if you roll back some of these laws, there's a lot of black people or gay people that just flat out wouldn't have jobs because people are like, ah, oh, dude, you're fucking black. Like, I'm not hiring you. Get the fuck out of here. Why would you want to set up areas? Well, that's in because the South was economically retarded. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the reason is. I'm telling you what the reality is. Do you think the person that loses the job because of their skin color is going to care what the reason is? If there aren't these protections in place and people are allowed to discriminate on this, all you're doing is further fractioning, fracturing society and encouraging people to not assimilate and encouraging people to stay in their own little cultures and communities and ghettos because you refuse to assimilate them into the culture because you allow people to this discriminate is, this them. Is this is pretty amazing that you're making this argument right now when we were just talking about the Islamic problem with immigration. We already have a cohesive... Uh, well, we did for a bit. We had a society that had worked out all these problems through time, luckily, and it was very Western, very democratic, very liberal society, I think we could say, uh, until we brought in, or especially in Europe, until we started bringing in tons and tons and tons of Islamic refugees and migrants and uh, tons of third world refugees and migrants, and they started creating enclaves. The enclaves we have are not gay Okay. Enclaves where some of these enclaves may have been created, okay? But like these are areas that in a lot of places have been mitigated. Germany, for the most part, is doing pretty good considering the massive amount of laborers that they've taken into their country. A lot of these Syrian refugees are replacing people that were there working illegally. A lot of these. <laughs> what? What? What are you on about? You're saying they're replacing people that were there illegally? Sure, yes. It's one of the things that a lot of the Syrian refugees have come in because they're accounted for by the government because they have to be there legally. They've replaced a lot of the illegal immigrants that are working. No, no, no. no. In... These migrants are not coming in legally. They're, most of them are coming in illegally and Syrian have no Syrian refugees into Germany? First of all, most of them aren't Syrian. I, I've gone to the camps in Germany. I've gone to Tempelhof. I've gone to Listen, you haven't gone anywhere, dude. Where you okay, go and talk to no, where you go and talk to a few <laughs> dozen people doesn't mean anything. You realize that I can go anywhere in the world and get and solicit any kind of opinion I want to form whatever opinion I want about a place if I talk okay, okay, to the right fine. people, we'll talk right? About, we'll talk about the statistics. The majority yeah, sure. the, the statistics show that the majority of the people that are coming over Germany's borders and the European borders are not Syrians. That okay, is just sure. a fact. You can look it up quite quickly right now. The majority of them are not Syrians. Sure, and I was talking about the Syrian refugees, but sure, there are other work, immigrants, sure. The programs that they're bringing in for work in Germany are one euro a day work. It's ridiculous. They're paying them one euro, and it's simply because Merkel and her crew wanted to increase uh, their employment statistics, so they offered 100,000 refugees one euro a day work, and they're putting them to work in jobs that, quite frankly, Germans do want, and Germans are being denied, uh, well, people are being denied 
German citizenship and such because of the amount of refugees and they're being denied jobs because of these one euro a day jobs. It's a huge problem there. And if you talk to Germans and yes, I'm going to I'm not I'm going to use an example where you actually talk to these people, not just read Huffington Post. If you talk to Germans, it is a huge problem there on the ground level. And I think it's important that you that's include I've never heard of the one euro a day thing. And I've been to Germany over okay, well, a dozen times right now. and I've talked to you right now. You can look it up. <laughs> okay. Look up look up one euro uh, refugee jobs. It'll be the first thing that comes up. OK. Germany puts refugees to work. German government to employ 100,000 immigrants on one euro an hour. I need hour. a real it's, article. Breitbart doesn't count. I need an actual Breitbart, article. Breitbart, okay, if the stats, if, if, okay, if the information behind it is cited properly, then you can't just say I'm going to not listen to this site because it's Breitbart. No, you're Look right. At what so it, I, I would go to the, to the next site, but they, they're citing something in German. Let's see how the YouTube translator thing works. Here's an article for you. Germany's economy surges in the fastest rate in five years. I, I don't know how they're able to do it despite taking on all of these huge immigrants and everything. It seems very strange, but, and this is cited by Reuters, not Breitbart. I'll see if I can get a translation on this German article. Okay, I'm opening this article you sent over. Also, I don't know how you can possibly think that going to talk to people is useless. What do you think reporters do? What do you think their jobs are? <laughs> their jobs are not to decide economic policy. Their jobs are to sell stories to people, to push a narrative. That's what reporters what are you do. What talking about? What do you I, mean? Like, News is a business. Do you think okay, that when I, people I, go to draft economic policy, they open up YouTube and they see what people thought about the things in Germany? No, they're pulling no, no, stats no, 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 from no, no, research no. centers. I'm talking about, okay. So, <laughs> wait, 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 I just want to get this straight. You think that going and talking to people on a ground level is totally useless? Yes. Yes. You think that yes. finding out the experiences of the individuals living in communities is useless for working on policy? Yes. Really? Yeah. Really? Yes, of course. Why would you care? Because when you're talking about policy, you're talking about dictating policy to hundreds of thousands or millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people. Unless you're well, collecting. That's, that's the problem. That's the problem with uh, large government. It, it's kind of it's been a big thing for a while. Uh, for example, dealing with homeless issues. When that becomes a federal issue, you have they're just give them money, give them money. When in certain areas, the homelessness is going to be a problem because of job loss. And if you go and you talk to the individuals there, you'll find that out. Or the homeless problem is going to be because of. Uh, drug problems, and if you go and you talk to the people there, you talk to the. They say all of these homeless people are on drugs. You have to talk to the people living in these communities instead of trying to make blanket policies. You have to talk to people that are living there to understand what the problems are. When I went to the Calais jungle, I mean, you can you can listen to all of the uh, studies you want that are coming out, but when I went there face to face and I talk, literally talked to hundreds of people. I know you say, what did you talk to one, two people? No, I spoke to hundreds of people there. I couldn't find any Syrians, Steve, and I couldn't. I found one Syrian refugee there. That is the reality in my face. It doesn't matter what Huffington Post says. It doesn't matter what MSNBC says. If you go to this area and you talk to the people there, the reality in front of your face is different from the reality that is being sold to you by liberal shills. You and do you... Do you at least understand that I could go to any part of the world and get any opinion that I want if that was my goal? You know that I could do that, right? Or anybody could do that, right? Right, but I'd be hard. I think you'd be hard pressed to go to a community of uh, a thousand people and talk to two hundred of them and get the exact same answer over and over again. I'm not Syrian. I think you'd be pretty hard pressed <laughs> to get the exact answer you want from the majority of the people there. I mean, 1,000 people doesn't sound representative of anything. Even if you talk to 1,000 people, like, which I have a hard time believing that you would go and... But you know, that... poll, okay, okay, let, let, wait, wait, you know polls only talk to hundreds of people, and you consider those more reliable? <sighs> okay. Do you, <laughs> do you understand what a cross-sectional analysis is? Do you understand what it means when somebody says that? Does that, mean, does that phrase mean anything to you? No, elaborate. Okay, when you're polling groups of people, okay, if you're, if you're a good stats person, when you go to poll groups of people, the raw number isn't really that important, you know, to, to get these confidence intervals that, that are important to you, right? The goal is to make it so that you have a representative sample of the population that will give you good polling results that can be um, extrapolated to entire populations. So let me give you sure. an example. If I poll... 10,000 people in one poll, and I pull 5,000 in another, and I ask you, which is the better poll? 
You don't have any idea. There's not enough information. If I pull 10,000 people in my city in Nebraska, in Omaha, and I say, what do you guys think about some political issue? And I do a 5,000 person cross-sectional poll that has an equal representation of diversities proportional to how they're represented in the United States, all across the United States, right? That poll with half the number of people, or even only a thousand people, is going to be infinitely more valuable than the larger poll, right? So when you just throw a number at me and say, do you believe this poll that only cites five or six or 700 people? Well, I don't know, it depends on how the poll was conducted. The number has absolutely nothing to do with the validity of the poll. This is how stats work, right? Okay, so I see, now the raw numbers don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> no, when you go to an area, Lauren, you are not picking out 150 people that represent the, the country by gathering demographics and doing data analysis to figure out who the best people are. You're going into one neighborhood or one small part of a city in a country, in, a, in an entire region, and then talking to all the people there. This would be the equivalent of me going down and, and knocking on neighborhood doors in a, in, a, in a few blocks and then saying like, well, look, I have 250 people that I all talk to and these represent the entire city. No, that's not true at all. When you're on the ground and you go and you talk to people, I'm guessing that you're not getting a wide amount of data beforehand and finding people from all all over the country to talk to or even all over the city to talk to you can get dramatically different opinions from people in the exact same city depending on which part of the city that you go to is what i'm saying how do you know i'm not doing that <laughs> because if you did i think that you would be submitting what you're doing as actual studies or papers that would be peer reviewed oh, I do. and then would be it. you know you know cross-sectional analysis is are done by people who make judgments yeah, but usually these judgments are data-driven, not, not from Breitbart or the rebel media. See, no, we don't believe in science again. <sighs> I mean, like, I'm just saying, talking to people, as pollers do, is, is important in getting their opinions. And I, I listen to interviews with lefties on the ground. I talk to lefties on the ground. I talk to righties on the ground. You're, you're talking about right now how we need to just have a honest conversation. That's what I try to do. I go and I sit down and I have honest conversations. I, okay. one of my, I one of my greatest it. videos I think I uploaded was an honest conversation just with a German who was experiencing having his wife, having her, um, application to Germany denied to make room for refugees. And she spoke German. She was German and I believe she was German in heritage and it was just a devastating experience for him and getting to know these real stories that are impacted by policy, I think does like what, what what do you not want us to upload photos uh like interviews with syrians that are being bombed and knowing the reality of the situation simply because that doesn't matter compared to my polls and my policies no these, these real experiences do matter how our policies affect people you do literally matter. you understand Talking that you are giving me matters. right you're giving me the feels versus reels right now that's what you're giving me right now you understand that right can you at least admit no no, no i think i think no I no think no, no, polls, no no hold on no no i don't want you to back because you just but... said that like well if you're talking to a guy about how his wife couldn't get in like you're talking me feels right now you're give, you're feeding me paragraph after paragraph of feels right now and you're telling me you don't care about the reels because I do care about the reels. I never said I didn't care about then the Then why reels. are you I saying that like, well, with this I one heartbreaking conversation about, oh. with this guy, because I could give you a million heartbreaking conversations about Syrians whose cities were destroyed that you're saying are, are should be compared to the disgusting sugar-free jelly I beans or, or, no, no, or gummy I'm saying, bears. I'm saying I think we should know what is going on on the ground. Sure, but the way Data that... Data is the plural of anecdote. I think we need to no, know what is... No, it's not. No, it's not. It's absolutely not. It's absolutely not. Data is not the plural of anecdote. Data is a carefully constructed and collected thing that you have to be very rigorous about to make sure that it's giving you an accurate representation of, uh, to give you a complete picture of what's going on. As humans, right? This is a little bit of psychology and biology, right? As humans, your mind is not capable of sifting through large amounts of data without some kind of thing there to moderate it to make sure that your own biases don't come into play in terms of how you evaluate it. That's why somebody is able to show you a, 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 a video of something and then convince you that all of these people are evil or all of these people are good based on like a couple of videos of seeing something, right? That's why you're saying like, well, look at all these violence against Trump supporters now because like two videos have come out of some crazy fucking black people beating up white people, which is disgusting, right? But now people have it out like, well, every single BLM person is violent and every single black person in the United States is trying to fuck white people. Like, well, damn, that's I, I don't not think, true. I don't think everyone is saying every single Black Lives Matter person is violent. I think we you look don't at think the, I can go I don't on Twitter, know, listen, listen, really? listen. I think, we, I think we look at the protests they have and see hundreds of them cheering in the street, we want dead cops, and then we see cops die, and we think, huh, you know, I think all those people that were marching in that 
March may support what happened. I don't think every sure. single one of them is but, killing cops, but I think they might all support it. But you also don't cover the hundreds of protests and rallies that go off peacefully. The only thing you see is the worst. And it's the same thing with the refugees as well. Or the same thing with Islamic terrorism. You said it yourself. Well, you guys in the United States, you had Islamic terrorist attacks. Yeah, but we also have three million Muslims, dog. How many people even live in Toronto? I think we have more Muslims in our country than there are people that live in your city. Um, like... But 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 because you've seen a video, you know, every other month or whatever, every few months of people, you know, well, these Islams are committing terrorisms all over the place. They're homogenous people. They all think the same. Like, damn, that's not true. Like, if, if you go and you talk to people on the ground and you talk to a couple dozen people, you can manufacture any opinion that you want about any person that you want. That's the problem. That's fine, the fine. Let's let's look at the let's look at the peer reviewed data on that by peer research on Muslims. <laughs> do you want to do that since you since you like uh since you seem to like that a lot, do and I do too. I like my data, data on Christians as, as well. I, I bring that up. I don't know. No, do you, do you no, have, no. This do you have the... support that shows that like seventy percent of uh, Christians believe that there should be arrest and prosecution for anyone who insults their religion? I'd love to see that because that exists in the UK for Muslims. Do you understand the problem that you just committed fundamentally? Like that that already shows that your own biases, right? You just said that? that you went to Pew Research to find stats on how Muslims think because you're already convinced that they're bad people and you don't even know the numbers on Christians. You don't even know them. Well, I can tell you right now, <laughs> if I bring up the, the numbers on Christians because I've I don't have time to. You've Christians already told me. Life. You've already I've told me you don't even know them. You don't even care what they are. <laughs> Okay, I okay. Let's you know what? Let's look them up right now. Let's look them up right now because I think there are some things that you can kind of look at the data, for example, on radical terrorism and see Christianity is quite low uh, compared to recently Islam, which compared is quite to high. Islam. Yes, recently, sure. There you go. All right, here I've got the data on Christians. Let's look at it together right now because you said you don't know either. I no, I've looked it up before. And if you look at how Christians view women and women's rights and women's roles in the household compared to the men, they're all also pretty fucking abhorrent. It's pretty bad. Not quite as bad as Muslims, depending on where you pull them from, but geopolitically, a lot of these areas the Muslims live in are a lot more fucked than our cozy little places. Okay, no, no, I want, I want you to read out some of the I want you to read out some of the data you have on Christians. I'm really curious. I don't curious. have it on hand. I've read it in the past. I mean, oh, we can, can, can you bring it up? Can you bring it up? I'm really curious. <sighs> sure thing. Because I've got stuff, I've got, I've got the Pew Research data here on Muslims wanting to kill women for dishonoring the family. I've got the research here on Muslims wanting Sharia and full submittance of women to them. If you have stuff like that that's comparative to Christians, I would be fascinated okay, to see that. You have to look at how people act, though, not just what they want. Oh, believe me, exactly. That's what I do. I go and I talk to them in real life, and I go and okay, I observe But then you haven't been able to explain works. to me why three million Muslims live in the United States and there aren't fuckloads of terrorist attacks. Clearly, there's something going on here that your model isn't accounting for. If 80% of these people want to burn apostates or, or for burn people for apostasy and murder people for, you know, heresy and shit, why aren't they doing it in the West? It's called America has a far more hawkish immigration policy than Europe right now. Even in Europe. When it comes to Islam. Even in Europe. Even in Europe. Europe, you can. Oh, oh boy. If you look at it, literally just look up the amount of refugee crimes just this week. Just in this Germany, week. refugees looked... commit less crimes than the native people. <laughs> well, how many refugees are there? Compared to native people, per capita, Steven. I'm only talking per capita, Lauren. I'm never going to talk about raw. I'm talking about per yeah. capita. <laughs> All right, can you send me the stats on that? <sighs> okay, hold on. Because you can't just make a statement like that. And here you go. Especially There's a nice little the Wikipedia has... article on it. You could probably click the footnotes or whatever. All right, criminal activity by immigrants. Here's an article from The Atlantic. I don't know if that's too left-leaning or libcuck for you. Here's an argument no, from right DW.com. Report, refugees have not increased crime rate in Germany. <clears throat> Where does fear from refugees come from? And, and you do know, just, just so you know, for I'm reading this right now, but just so you know, a lot of these crimes are covered up and have been covered up historically, for example. <sighs> Then uh, don't, the then, okay, sure. No, I'm just saying, just saying, you, like, don't you ask me for that, right? I don't know, dude, to what level? There's you, probably you don't illegal... acknowledge there was a cover up the Roth room rapes. I, I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with it exactly. I haven't heard of any massively widespread cover-ups of crimes being committed by immigrants, though. Well, apparently you haven't been paying attention to the immigration crisis in Europe, then. I guess not. Can, d then don't, don't waste time <laughs> reading my links, because then if everything I send you, you're just going to say is false and made up, then there's no point in trading any data or whatever. No, 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 I'm, I told you I'm reading it right now. I'm just... 
prefacing it by saying, do you understand the situation in Europe where they have a mass cover up of migrant crime? Like, have you been looking into this? Have you been keeping up with what happened uh, at Köln Station in um, Cologne? Sure, Do you know what mainly, but most of the perpetrators there were from the North African refugees, but people seem to try to pin that right, on what are, you, what are you, racist now? <laughs> we, we don't like Africans now? <laughs> Not when they're fucking raping people, damn, dude. But I'm just saying that people like you like oh. to extrapolate that real quick to fucking everybody. When the, when right, the type so, of immigrant... So no, more, the... so no more migrations for Africans. Sure, yeah, if that's the policy. That's a, but listen, listen, you're laughing at that, but that's a good conversation. We have an area that has migrants that are committing crimes at much okay, higher rates than everybody I, I else. Actually th I actually think that's a really good point, I think, because I think that's uh, exactly what Trump's point was when he said no, we have a group that's, that's committing terrorism. No, listen, no, no. listen, we, listen, we have a group that's committing terrorism at a much higher rate than anyone else. Yeah, and his agree group that? is do you Muslims. Agree, do you agree that Muslims are committing terrorism at a much higher level than everyone else? Not all of them, no. No, but do you agree that, oh, not, not all Africans are committing crime, Stephen, not all Africans. I'm not talking about all Africans. Yeah, but I'm you're talking about the ones maybe... from North Africa that are specifically okay. coming from these countries causing problems. Not, not, all, not all North Africans are committing crime, though, and causing problems. What, okay, so the difference between what you're saying Trump has said and what I'm saying is that you would try to narrow this down as much as possible to, from a specific region. Trump has labeled every Muslim from any country that has any ISIS activity as a terrorist, okay? You realize there's a big difference between that he, and No, he, he never said that. He never said that. He never Trump said, said that. Trump said that I want to ban all Muslims from immigrating that are from these countries that have ISIS activity, more or less is what he said. What, what am I wrong sure. about there? Not, not ban. He wants to stop it until they can figure it out. Which What's means wrong nothing. With... What does that mean? Figure it out. That means we see what happens when we stop that immigration. We see if levels fall. We see if we can find a proper screening for okay. these Muslim what do you mean by proper? We, we already screen these guys more than any other group has ever been screened entering the United States. I think of the 780,000 Syrian refugees we've taken into the United States, three have been charged with plotting an attack. They haven't even been able to do anything of the 780,000 refugees we've let in. I mean, that seems to be like pretty decent numbers. Okay, well, that's because we're screening the hell out of them, and maybe that's sh what we should be doing. Okay, that's but what... Trump's argument is that we weren't screening anyone. We just let these guys in, and we don't know where they're from, and, we, you know, we need to put a stop on this until we can figure out what's going on. What do you mean figure out what? We've already figured it out. We have the most extensive screening process for these people of anybody anywhere in the world, in the history of the world, of any country ever. So he's—, he's this is the thing. You're saying— what about North Africans? Do you think we need more screening on North Africans? Because this is a point you brought up, which I want to go back to, because Trump— has narrowed it down from all Muslims to not only just from all people, he's narrowed it down to all Muslims and he's narrowed it down to Muslims from ISIS controlled areas. And he said we need to create a better vetting process. Is that not exactly what you want for North no, Africans? No, because when he says better vetting process, he's implying that we have none. And he's gone on record saying that we don't vet these people, which is absolutely not true. It's just misinformation. It's propaganda. Well, okay, whether he said that or not, he's saying he, we don't. what he meant and what he has come out and said before. He, of course, he went back, and I, whether I agree with this or not, he went back and he said we're not going to stop all immigration. We're going to do better vetting. And do you not want better vetting for Muslims from ISIS-controlled areas? Let me just ask you that. No, I don't think so. No, right now. you don't no. want better vetting from for, for Muslims you're, you're, you're from ISIS-controlled areas. You're using areas. like weasel words. What do you mean better? Can any everything can be better? Do you want better? What do you mean it, right okay, now? So why wouldn't you want it? Why wouldn't you want better vetting? Because it costs more money. Because it's not worth implementing. Like, what do you mean it's not worth implementing? Because it costs more money, and you don't get any results for it. That's the definition of not worth it. And you don't get results for. How do you know that? Because right now, it seems like of the almost a million refugees we've gotten, we haven't had any terrorist attacks out of them, and a very, 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 very small minority of them have already been you've caught. You've taken in a million, you've taken in a million refugees in America? I think it was like 700, um, 780,000, I think was the number. Um, hold on. Oof, I don't know if this is a liberal link or not, it might not be true. 784,000 refugees since September 11th, 2001. And of those 784,000 refugees, three have been arrested for plotting a terrorist attack. Sorry, how many was that? Three. No, 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 no. How many? 784,000. Uh, Can you send me this article? Yeah, I linked it on um, Twitter. Or okay. Skype, I'm sorry. No. Skype. No problem. Also, right now, I think there can be a better vetting process because at the moment, we are not, um, we are not doing ideological tests for immigration, so we're not 
testing whether they believe in Sharia or whether we should have honor killings for women or whether we should uh, throw gays off roofs. Do you not think there should be any sort of vetting process for whether you want to throw gays off roofs or not? That, the problem is those are really hard questions to ask because we live Why in, are those hard questions to ask? Because we live in Christian question. countries where people murder abortion doctors and still commit hate crimes against gay people. So the natives still believe in some of that shit. I don't know. I don't know. Like, if that's so you a, want to bring in more people that believe in that? I don't know. I'm just not just because so, this is what I'm trying to say. OK, the, the, <laughs> like, OK, I'm having trouble following. I, I know that's because I don't think you were raised in a religious household. I was raised in a very, I was raised in a, okay. I was raised in a religious okay. household, as I told you on Twitter. If you were raised in a religious household. OK, I was raised in a very religious household. OK, I went to Catholic school right. for 12 years of my life. The way I went that to you. Christmas. Protestant school. Okay. The, uh, sorry, okay. Pentecostal. Protestant. So you're not even like a real fucking. I went Christian. to Pentecostal. Oh school. my god, you're not even. Okay, so I'm a Catholic. And I'm okay? going so to Catholic I know, mass tonight. So I know about religion. Okay, <laughs> I'm a Catholic. I'm a hardcore member. Okay, listen. You, but even so, as a Protestant, you should know this. Okay, the teachings of your holy book and the way that your people think about different things don't necessarily play out that way in real life. Do you agree or disagree with that statement? Do you want me to elaborate more I on agree. that? I agree. I think I think Christians are quite. Uh, I think they're quite peaceful compared to especially things in the Old Testament. Sure. Okay. So like you can but also have... this moral equivalence is kind of ridiculous. No, no. I'm just trying to illustrate the point that you have a lot of Christians that believe that things like gay marriage are abhorrent and morally disgusting and wrong. And maybe see... okay. maybe Let me hold know on, 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 on. Christians are throwing people off roofs. Maybe if you maybe sure. if you put well, I mean Christians have murdered gay people in the past in the United States. I can give you a giant wiki list of all the crimes, hate crimes that have been committed against gay people. I don't know why you're acting like this doesn't happen. There's there's a reason why the LGBT community exists and why they're so adamant against things like this. But I can pull a t But that being said, if somebody were to come up to me and say, well, Destiny, if you pull, or Stephen, if you were to pull on these Christians, look, 62% of them think that gays are immoral. How are you going to tell me that Christians don't all want to murder gay people? Then I would say, well, if you look at how it actually plays out in real life, there are a fuck ton of Christians. Okay, and so, a lot so of them don't want to hurt or murder gay people, right? right? right. Maybe let, they'll say that in a poll, but they're not actually going to go out and murder a gay person. Okay, let's, let's look at how it plays out in real life. Uh, what do you think would happen to me uh, if I were transgender and I went to Dubai? What do you think would happen to me? It depends on what part of Dubai you go. Are you out of the touristy <laughs> section with the no, massive what, what buildings? Do you, what do you think would happen to me if I'm openly transgender and I go to Middle Eastern countries? I'm probably going to be thrown off a roof and killed. That's how it plays out in real okay, life. Okay, but those in are in Middle are Eastern Syria countries. Control. What if you if go I'm to do that in I front of some... Church, I'm pretty okay. What if you go to some Muslim... Well, first of all, what if you go to some fucked areas in Sudan that are very Christian, right? You know that Mexico, that place that has all those fucking problems to the south was to the cartels. That's a, that's like an 88% Roman Catholic country. Those are very religious people, very Christian, right? What about the NRA dudes in fucking Ireland or whatever that shot up all those... Like, fuck it. You can find examples of violent whoa. Christianity. <laughs> what? Whoa, whoa, whoa. You can find examples of violent Christianity, but you have literal countries that base their nation's law as stoned women throw gays off roofs. Sure. Where do you have a Christian country that has that in their law? The problem is that you're looking at these geopolitical hotspots that have so many other things going on with them that for you to just say, well, look, Muslims, therefore, they're fucked, is so ignorant of the history of the regions, of everything going on. And, and All right, it, let's, let's look at this. Let's look at, let's look at the stats on Christians and homosexuality. Uh, this is Pew Research. Acceptance of homosexuality is rising across the broad spectrum of American Christianity, including among members of churches that strongly oppose homosexual yep, Catholics relationships. Especially. As I remember this growing up. Yeah, they are going uh, percentage of people saying homosexuality should be accepted by society. 70% Catholic. Woo, that's up 66%, 62% uh, Orthodox Christian, 52%, 54% all Christians. Like this is this is nothing compared to Islam. Nothing compared to Islam. Okay. You would never find that in Islam. Then why don't we have the three million Muslim people in the West constantly murdering gay people? What's going okay, you on? Keep talking, you keep talking about this. These ones that are already in the West. First of all, a lot of these ones that were accepted have already been quite westernized. Although because we have a very well, okay. hawkish. What does westernized mean? What does that mean to you? They've actually been assimilated into the culture and don't want to cut off people's heads for uh, <laughs> for publishing a photo of Muhammad. I yes, mean, they're, they're exactly. getting more extreme. So we, they're getting uh, more extreme at the moment as we bring in more of them and, okay. and as we bring in more from uh, ISIS controlled areas. And they aren't just, for example, I, you know, I don't I don't particularly like it. But if we're bringing in Muslims that are like from America, I'd be far, far more supportive of American Muslims that have been in America for 40 years than Muslims coming straight from the Listen, Middle East. I agree with and you. I think Everything you're saying, 
oh my God, everything you're saying is so absolutely correct. So it's almost like there's something going on here that's so much more important than the religion of the person. Do you, you just made that argument beautifully, Lauren, that people coming from the Middle East, a fucked up geopolitical area, are bringing with them a lot of fucking crazy and stupid beliefs, but people in the West, even if they're Muslim, because they're part of this culture, because they've been living in the West, are way more well, moderate than well, these people wait, in these... Wait, wait, wait. No, no, the Christians coming from these areas are quite peaceful and calm and are not causing even remotely the same amount of crime or terrorism. Uh, in fact, they're the ones that are getting murdered on their boats over. <clears throat> it's the Christians that are the ones getting, like absolutely okay but people that are coming areas. from these crazy fucked places in the no, middle no, no, no. east it's muslims coming from these areas that are crazy places that are specifically committing crime christians coming from these places are not committing any terrorism at uh, all it's all I, i'm not sure if that's true but i mean the majority of people right now over there are muslims and all of their funding are coming from muslims so it would make sense that muslims are more in charge i don't know if i buy that that christians haven't caused any terrorism in the middle east i'm not sure if that's true or not but i mean you're talking about like muslim majorities ruling over muslim minorities and all of this shit going on like it would make sense that most of the terrorism is going to be related to muslim shit like isis isn't going to go sure. fucking okay so you, christians. you you read my book yes yeah in the book, I state quite clearly that the Christian governments in Uganda and Nigeria are just as bad as the Muslim ones. We, we talked about, like, I, I specifically laid that out in my book. Okay. But they are the outlier. Extreme Islamic governments are not the outlier. But if you look at geo, if you look at geographically where these Muslim governments exist, they're all across. You have like the northeast mm, of Africa, you've got the Middle East, and then you've got a little bit on Southeast Africa. But all these Muslims in the Western world somehow seem to have assimilated just fine. It's almost like the religion plays a secondary role to culture and other things. It's almost like the religion and culture are related and they bring over uh, a lot of those things when they come over. And when you get go to towns like Mark Slow or Luton. You're talking about these heavily ghettoized these... areas of these people that have been uh, yeah, moved off to these. Yeah, and guess who is ghettoizing them? Guess who is ghettoizing them? In it's... some places, it's the population. When you've got a population of people that says, fuck you, we don't want you here. Go live somewhere else. Fuck you. Get out of our society. Like, what do you mean? You don't think that the culture of these local places plays into this at all? You, you know what's happening there, right? It's the Muslims that are creating Sharia zones and saying, fuck off, we don't want you here. This is a Muslim zone. This is a Sharia-controlled area. It is not the other way around. They're not sitting there with open arms like, why won't anyone talk to us, poor little Muslims? Then how do you have, have people friends. in Germany that have integrated so well? People up. They're sitting there beating people up like Tommy Robinson, who try, who lived there before them. They are, they are ghettoizing themselves. <laughs> Then why do you have people that live in Germany, all of these immigrants and refugees and shit that live in Germany or Sweden and other places that have integrated okay, into okay, the economy the, the so well? That is happening, the reason that is happening is because to westernize Muslims, you have to be willing to only take as many Muslims as you can westernize and also only take the ones that are willing to be westernized. And some of those, I will admit, do exist. They are very, very few and far between, but they do exist. And when you were taking them at a rate that they could assimilate and not at a rate where they are creating Mark Slows and Lutons, that's fine, and that's where you had America come in. America is not bordered on the Middle East, where they are coming off, coming in, en masse, uh, as completely unemployable, low IQ, just absolutely like hopeless migrants coming in. What do you mean unemployable, low IQ? What I mean, these yeah, people can you, do low skill have, labor. No, 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 no. Okay, <laughs> not if they're radicalized. Not if they believe women are literal cattle to be raped and killed. You can't fix that. You can't. Someone who is, some of these people have been so ingrained in their uh, radical culture that you can't fix it. So you pick the people that are not ingrained in the radical culture, specifically in a lot of cases, the Christians that are there that are trying to escape, that are already quite pro-Western culture, or the few and far between Muslims that are pro-Western culture, that are pro- I don't know how uh, you can say situation. few and far between when there are all of these countries across Europe that have relied on immigrants to sustain their, their lower working- What do you mean? I'm working... talking about Muslims without radical beliefs. They're few and far between if you look at the Pew Research of their beliefs, especially- I don't care about I mean, the Pew countries... Research. The Pew Research makes Christians look bad, depending- If you look at things like gender equality among Christians, too, I don't care about the Pew Research. No, 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 I care no, about I'm the actual I'm number of terrorist gender... attacks- Okay, we're not talking about just terrorist attacks. We're talking about people who ghettoize themselves. We're not talking about people that are... Uh, I'm not talking about... Luton isn't blowing everything up every right, left, and center. I'm talking about them creating Sharia zones and only speaking Arabic and only talking to other Arabic people and only putting their women uh, in niqabs and wanting Sharia law and wanting to vote in Sharia law. I'm talking about them taking over these places culturally and just completely being outsiders in this country of their own 
and on their own merit. And these are the people that you can't bring in en masse because they will change the culture of the country and they won't assimilate and it'll become a problem for you. I guess, um, I, I don't know, I, I guess I have to look into it more because I'm not seeing these examples like all across Europe where all of these Muslims are moving in and creating all of these ghettos and all these places. I well, know that it I, does happen try, in some try, areas. Try there. Try, I've been there myself. No, I'm not interested. I'm, I'm, I, 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 I prefer I to stick in the realm of interested. reality. No, because I don't want to go to some place to manufacture an opinion for my media source to feed a narrative of the people that to come and watch my shit. Manufacture an opinion. Yes, that's what you, so when, you, you go, when you go on the ground and you try to talk to a couple dozen people in, a, in an area, you're trying to manufacture an opinion. Yes. Doesn't, no, no, I'm saying, I, I'm telling you right now, go and live there. Speak to the people who live there. L watch Tommy Robinson's stuff. He's got fascinating uh, commentary on this. He grew up and lived in Luton. He has many Muslim friends. He's read the Quran through and through. The guy is not an idiot. He knows exactly what he's talking about. And I think it is definitely worth you checking that out and reading into it. And it's certainly reading into, because you love your statistics, and I do too, reading into the statistics of what the people living there support and the culture they support, and the amount of Muslims living there, and the birth rates, and the amount that area is growing, because no-go zones are a very real thing. I went into Europe on my trip there, and just so people know that are listening to the stream, I will be going back and doing uh, more on-the-ground stuff there, because uh, I think it is worth finding out if this is real, and worth finding out if these crazy statistics coming from Pew Research are real, hearing it from the horse's mouth. To, so. I, I personally am always looking for more information on this, and all of the information I've seen uh, from talking to people that live there, from looking at the Pew Research, shows that these are radicalized areas that are causing problems in Europe. I don't know what you're looking at. You just keep saying, not all Muslims, not all Muslims. I mean, I or look at all of the economic data that shows really good growth in all of these areas. I look at the okay, necessity okay. <laughs> for immigrants to fill in these labor markets. I mean, you don't I look think at there's a cultural problem. I, it's hard. I don't know what you mean by cultural problem. Like I hear really crazy statements and I was like, immigrants are going to outnumber us, like crazy, weird things like that. I don't know. Like when you say culture problem, it seems like if you get people in an area and you integrate them into the society, you get them learning the language, you invest however much money you need to to make sure that they're doing that and you're integrating them into your markets and whatnot, that after a couple generations, they tend to assimilate. That seems to be what, unless there are extraneous factors going on that are either gentrifying them out of areas or forcing them to ghetto fire in certain areas or gathering all a bunch of places where, where they can maintain maintain their own cultures and shit, right? It seems oh, you like... Keep... Sorry, sorry, I keep interrupting you. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't know. It seems like, it, it, for everything I read, it seems like when government is willing to spend money on integrating people, and places like Germany, I think, are a good example, you get a lot of laborers coming in that help to ease friction in some of your markets, that function as laborers in your market, that help the economy overall and stimulate it and end up being a net positive on, on everything. Okay, so you think that right now the immigrants at the level that Germany is bringing in, that are all walking across there illegally, trying to find welfare, living in these refugee camps, working for a dollar a day, you think that they're helping the economy right now? That That's what, I don't even know if the dollar a day thing is real. Somebody linked me an article I mean, saying that it's a bullshit thing that was never actually even enacted, but the, but that's just the translation that I'm getting, so I'm not okay, sure. Okay, you, okay, so you think the migrants, okay, let's just scrap that. You think the migrants that are coming in going on welfare, living in refugee camps uh, that can't speak the language, you think they are a net positive to the economy? The, the, those particular people? No. The, but because I think this, that, is the, this is the majority of people, the migrants coming over the borders. How is Germany able to sustain all of these leeches and then post record growth over, <laughs> compared to the last five years? What are they doing? I don't know about this whole uh, ref or this whole record growth thing going on. Uh, I'd have to look into exactly that. Uh, but I can tell you right now, logically looking at the situation, I don't think anyone could say that that is a benefit to the economy. In fact, even Merkel was saying they had taken in too much and it is causing problems and they're begging for money for people to support them. Germany is begging for money? I'm sorry, I need to a source support refugees. on that. Begging for money from who? Germany is like one of the strongest countries in the EU. Who are they begging for money from? Yeah, of course they're the strongest country in the EU. Let me, let, okay, here we go. Oh, also... Da, 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 da. I'm just going to find you a source on that. Sorry, maybe I meant be begging for help with refugees in general. Oh, they can't sure, help. Well, or right because now. they want to share the burden with the rest of Europe, I guess, if they're trying to... I mean, I mean it costs a lot of money to integrate and, and move all these people along. You think we have 40 years to bring all these millions of migrants and make them assimilate? 40 years? Wait, what? You, you were saying it takes about 40 years. I Maybe I misheard. You were saying it takes about 40 years to assimilate these refugees no I, I don't think i said that but i said that like after a few generations i imagine that they would be more assimilated than the people that sorry i'm reading an article right now sure
Apparently, Germany had a 6 billion euro surplus last year. Whew, I don't know, dude. All right, I linked to the article. Okay, checking that out. Not to mention the fact that once Syria is stable again, a lot of these refugees can leave and go back as well. Like, <laughs> They won't. <laughs> why not? Why would you go back to the Middle East when you could live in Germany on welfare? You, I mean, unless Germany isn't able to afford that welfare. You know welfare. that not everybody's goal in life is to live on welfare, that people have homes and families and memories from certain areas. These are, I know it's really hard to believe sometimes. Maybe I don't know what it's like in Canada, but these are actually human beings that have like their own dreams and aspirations and goals, and they have things that they like to do, that the goal of every human being isn't to just move somewhere and live off of welfare, right? You know that, right? I mean, a lot of them want to live on welfare. When you, That's why they're not just going and finding asylum in France. That's why they're not just staying in the Calais jungle. That's why they're trying to get to London. That's why they're trying to... You know what a refugee does, right? They get to a safe country and they stay there because you know, they're out of danger. That's a refugee. A refugee doesn't sure, to some extent. and choose countries. What the refugees are doing right now is they're saying, huh, which country has the most welfare? And they're moving all up to Northern Europe and Western Europe and they're moving away from Turkey. They're moving away from Greece. They're moving to countries where they have more. They've got a whole route that is planned out for them to get to the highest welfare nation. These aren't refugees. These are economic migrants. You don't think the people leaving from Syria are refugees? Well, a lot of them aren't Syrian. That's the thing. A lot of the people that are coming are not Syrian. They're migrants. It's it's just economic migrants. There's some Syrians, okay. sure. I, guess, okay, but sure. A lot I was talking about refugees again. I guess I would have to see where other people are coming from. But even if that's true, I don't understand what the problem is from immigrating out of an area to another area where you think more opportunity exists. Pardon? Sorry. I don't understand what the problem is from picking and choosing to live in another area where well, then better they're no economic... longer refugees. They're no longer refugees. They're suddenly economic migrants. Um, who, are, who are all of these people coming in that claim to be refugees that aren't actually? What groups of people are these? I'm not familiar with it. Okay. So uh, here's a, something from the Institute for the Global Economy in Kiel. They project that the annual cost for refugees to Germany's economy in the coming years will range from between 25 million and 55 million euros, a burden difficult to debate away, even if the economy does well. <laughs> what is that supposed to prove? That immigrants cost money. You can't debate that away. Of course they cost yeah, it's money. Not, it's not helpful to their country. No, nope, that's not, not what like... that article said. Read that sentence again. Read that sentence one more time. The annual cost of refugees to Germany's economy in the coming years will range from 25 million and 55 million euros, a burden difficult to debate away, even if the economy does well. Okay, but if the economy does well, and Germany posted a massive budget surplus last year... That right? likely has nothing to do with refugees, my dude. I'm sorry, but you're not making mass money from importing people, which uh, two-thirds of them can't read and write. I'm sorry, but you're not making money off that. I... I... I don't know, because it seems to me like every single European country does make money off of these laborers because this is a job market that dramatically needs to be filled. In countries where education is increasing and people are becoming increasingly unwilling to work low-skilled jobs and where birth rates are plummeting, it seems like these immigrants in every country that they've gone to have been helping the, the friction of these um, low-skilled labor markets. How, how, many, how many of these migrants and refugees are working right now? <sighs> Let's look it up. <laughs> oh, I'm looking, dog. Hold on. No problem. I'd have to say, like, I I'm looking through stuff right now, but uh, they likely, some of them, I mean, a lot of them don't speak the language. A lot of them uh, can't read or write. Uh, a lot of them have those issues. But I, don't, I wouldn't say they are, they're certainly not bringing jobs. I don't think anyone could argue that they're bringing jobs. They're filling jobs, likely, and driving down wages, which hurts the native population and makes the native population less able to consume goods. And well, which but they also the increase term, consumption. Of, but they also increase the consumption of goods and drive up demand for things like housing. With, with and, what money? With they're getting money from the government right now. Sure. So it's a form of economic stimulus, but they're also generating a service to the economy, assuming they're able to find work and and generate some kind of service or whatever that would increase GDP, right? I mean, this I've never a, been this was, Keynesian. <laughs> economics lover uh, but that's basically not if you want to help that, that's a quote if, from if Boras wanna... himself who said that when more immigrants come into a country they increase the size of the pie for all this is an argument literally from the economist yeah but everyone's said. getting smaller pieces no 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 they don't they, they, everyone's getting smaller pieces if you want to help the poor in Germany having the supply of labor be tight is a good thing 
Okay, but you could also argue that having the supply of labor as tight is a bad thing too, because it causes increases in prices as well. If you like, if you're like hyper fetishizing yeah, capitalist paid. markets, yeah, everyone's but not. Getting paid. But are they getting paid enough for it? I mean, we pay less prices today in general all across the world for things than we did twenty or thirty or forty years ago. Even if okay, income. If you, okay, you know what? why is immigration the only solution to jobs? Why can't we have uh, one thing that I'm a fan of? Because I understand the birth rates argument. Oh, we don't have enough. We don't have enough uh, people to fill these positions because birth rates are low. Well, first of all, I have a problem with us giving the money that should be going to German families and uh, European families to immigrants, making it less likely for these families, uh, European families to have kids because they can't afford it. But also, why don't we have foreign workers programs? Those are one of the best ones because then they aren't consuming mass amounts of welfare, as we know they do based on Center for Immigration Studies in America, based on um, Pew Research based on all, all of the research that shows these people consume a lot of welfare, um, and you fill those jobs temporarily. It's, well, I, thought, uh, I, don't yeah, I thought one of your complaints earlier solution. was that... I don't understand. Sorry? I thought one of your complaints earlier was that you didn't like people making money here and sending it back home. Isn't that exactly what these people would be doing? Yeah, but I have more of a problem with people getting welfare and sending money back home. <laughs> like, okay, I'd rather have but then your money. problem there isn't with immigration. Your problem is with the welfare state. It's sure, and that's problem. not going away anytime soon. Okay, but neither is immigration, so what, what, why not argue well, yes, about the thing can, that intellectually control, makes them... We can control immigration. You can also control yes. the welfare state. Unfortunately, that's people vote themselves higher welfare constantly. Okay, and people and the vote more themselves more immigration. Wait, like, what? No, 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 no. The more immigration you have, the higher the welfare state goes, because immigrants, on average, vote for higher welfare state. That's uh, also from Center of Immigration Studies. Uh, it's Mexicans in America. Goddamn, they love voting for higher welfare. <laughs> that's why that's why that was one of the big arguments for Trump from people that don't like like there there you realize there are people you were saying before that you don't think there are people on um the right that have a home they don't they feel like they don't have a home because they're marginally they're they're reasonably right wing but they don't agree with some of the extreme stuff that Trump says right they think he's a little crazy well a lot of their argument for voting Trump wasn't that they love him and he's their god emperor their argument was simply that if we have an open border uh, with Mexico the sheer amount of illegal migrants that will come in will inevitably continue to vote themselves more benefits and they will be forced to pay into a system that is more generous with strangers than it is with themselves and will eventually collapse. And eventually, if you have enough illegal migrants and enough Mexicans come over the border, you will have so many that they will never be able to get a conservative government again that will reel in the spending because these people are known historically based on voting records to continue to only vote Democrat, which appease, which appease migrant voters and not Typically, okay, can I, can I read you a paragraph? Can you tell me if you agree or disagree with this paragraph? <clears throat> One concern is that the negligence of a few will adversely affect the majority. I've long been a believer in the look at the solution, not the problem theory. In this case, the solution is clear. We will have to leave borders behind and go for global unity when it comes to financial stability. Do you agree or disagree with that Sorry, statement? We, we have to leave borders behind? And go for global unity when it comes to financial stability. I disagree with that. Okay, that's what Trump wrote in an op-ed to CNN in 2013. You realize that Trump is a globalist, that every intelligent person is a globalist because globalism has delivered the economies and the record standards of livings that the entire West has enjoyed for the past 30 or 40 years, right? Trump I, knows I wrote that. About, I wrote about this in my book, that businessmen benefit quite a lot from globalism. Everybody like, benefits quite a lot. No, 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 no the, little person, the little person doesn't really benefit from globalism. So the little lower They're class person today that goes home and can access a computer that's built on microfabricated chips that are made in China, like, you don't think that anybody in, in lower class society benefits from from the advantages of comparative advantage or or from any of the trade that we get from other countries or the fact that cars are cheaper or products are cheaper in general you don't think that any the fact that like walmart's customers like 82 percent of them are lower class citizens you don't think that any of these people are benefiting from globalization or, or okay you just said globalization globalism and globalization are two different things i'm sorry can you uh, define the difference my bad what's the difference between globalism globalization and globalization? globalization is yes the idea of the connected world uh the connected uh, it, like being able to talk to someone from China over the internet, where we have a globalizing world where we have everyone intercommunicating, yada, yada, yada. Uh, globalism, globalism, as in the political ideology, is the idea of having the European Union, the idea of having the, e the, um, oh, uh, the UN, having governments that are, to an extent, taking away the kind of national, the more national policies and making them global. So it's more of a political ideology than a natural phenomenon. It's, a, it's more of an economic one. 
than political. It's political as well. Globalism is very political. But it, but the focus is on the economy. That's the reason why globalism is a thing and has been so important to the success of the entire Western world, that everybody benefits from globalism. You know, like financial integration of markets is one of the most important factors in determining the success of that market. That's why something like the EU is so successful, right? Or, or so important. Hey, to, to glo globalization. Globalization is an economic phenomenon and globalism is a political theory. It's not just a theory, though. Why do you think have you um, you live in Canada? If you buy yeah. something um, from like a different province or whatever, do you really know? That's globalization. That's a natural economic phenomenon. Globalism okay. is a political theory that is in place by polit that is put in place by politicians, and or exercised rather by politicians. Okay, so and globalism that, that has like nothing to do. Union. It's it's forced. Basically, globalism forces, uh, forces kind of uh, the opening of borders. It forces. Uh, so when the, you talk about like trade agreements, taking away of power from nation states, it's not globalism is not economics the political theory globalization is economic okay i haven't heard that before but okay when, when i, mean, I, you when know, I look I up the definition of it i see the concept of globalism now is most commonly used to refer to different ideologies advocating globalization but But, you're, Let's see. but but I mean, like, I, I feel like the political and the economic things to some extent are inexorable, right? Like, I mean, there is going to be some politics that goes along with economic. Yeah, sure. There's going to be economics. <laughs> there's going to be economics involved with it, but it's the, the base is not an economic principle. The base is it is a political ideology. Man, I thought you read my book, dude. <laughs> I did. I read it. I even, but I, I was thought I thought we were focusing on economics and immigration, not culture memes. Well, I, most of my book is culture memes, not economic memes. I'm not an economist. Like I yeah, can but... I can bant about economics, and we can bring up studies all day. Like I, I can have those economic bants. But even you said yourself, you're not an economist either. That's no, why you had your economy. No, but all my prep that I spent was reading on book. all that all the prep that I spent with this. Well, I'm sorry you did your. I'm sorry you did your prep on one footnote in my book dude like I'm uh, well, sorry I thought that economics that. was the important well because your whole chapter is that immigration is ruining everything so I thought that the economic yeah, argument was going to be I, I mostly talk about the fact that these people aren't integrating and they're changing the but culture but there are people that have integrated in tons of areas oh boy some people integrated well I guess tons of people have integrated California tons has the if, I think if you put California as its own country it has the most immigrants in the world second to like and Russia it. You need to live in a town where you're just called a gringo all day or like you need to go and live in some of these border cities and some of these cities that have been just totally taken over. Like, you know, when I was younger, I actually had to I actually had to move like I, we have pretty good immigration in Canada, but I actually had to move out of the city I was living in because we couldn't speak English with our neighbors anymore. And it wasn't a racist thing. It wasn't Did you a live in Quebec. No, no, it wasn't French. They were speaking Indian. But um, we, we literally, or some sort of, some form of Indian, fuck, you can see how, uh, how cultured I am. No, I'm joking. But um, we literally couldn't speak the language with them. They didn't learn either of our national languages, French or English. So we moved to an area that was more European simply because they spoke the language. And it forced us to enclave ourselves up because we in Canada are a quote-unquote multicultural society. We were one of the first societies to make it a, well, Trudeau's father made us literally, like, what? in policy, a multicultural country. And it has caused a lot of problems for us here. Where did you live I, in Canada? I'm curious if you can name a city. I lived in a, where... place, I lived in a place called Surrey. If you look at the Guru Nanak area there, uh, it's around 77% Indian population. And none, and these people can't speak English? So They speak English so poorly that you had to move to survive? Like... Not to survive, obviously, but I mean, having a homogeneous society where you can communicate and do business with people living near you is a, a little bit beneficial, I'd say. I, I mean, I, I don't think you need to be <laughs> homogenous for it to do that. I think if you visit any successful place, you'll see tons of different people from tons of different backgrounds together that all seem to work together and function together just fine. Um, I, to put to my point for California, California on its own would have one of the largest economies in the world and is also has most of the immigrants that come like in the in the uh, the Spanish immigration or the Mexican immigration that happens from the south. Like a lot of that shit goes to California. California takes like the most immigrants of all of the fucking United States and they seem to be doing really, really, really well. It's like our, one of our, if not our most successful state. So I, I don't know. I This argument. Well, they're that, like, also one of the most. Uh, one of the big arguments would be all of them vote themselves more benefits. So, 
They still seem to be doing really fine, though. Maybe if certain benefits assist with things like integration or learning the language or different investments can be made in education. Aren't these positives for you that you would want people to get whatever they need to learn the language or to integrate better into the culture? Like, aren't these pros? Like, Honestly, I don't know about the situation in California too well. I'd have to speak. I'd have to look at the stats there more. I'd have to. Uh, like I haven't spent much time in California. I spent a tiny bit of time in LA, so I don't know about the specific situation in California. I would say the biggest cultural example is certainly Europe. L like I said, Canada has its problems, but I don't think it's gotten to the point where we have any violence or no-go zones. I mean, I have areas that I can't shop here because people will just be like, get out. <laughs> like you're, you're not Asian or you're not this, right? Uh, but like, it's certainly not at the extent to which it is in Europe where there are no-go zones, where there are areas that you can't live if you don't cover up. I mean, in Molenbeek in Belgium, it's like three quarters of the women there that have to cover up. And if you want to live there, like you do not want to go there if you're white. <laughs> Kind of thing. You don't want to go there if you don't, if you aren't Muslim. I mean, I guess it's not necessarily white, but if you're not Muslim and you're not following their laws, you don't want to live there. I have a problem with that. I have a problem with the very fabric of Western nations being changed because I think it's that very fabric and that very um, I, Western ideology that gives us the freedoms that we have today because that's the democracy that we have in these countries. And if you get rid of okay, that and you so change the real fast the people in the culture in this land, before, Sorry? before we gish gallop all of us here. Okay. Like looking up your place, this is why I don't like anecdotal stuff. The majority of people in this, in the area that you were in, that you said you had to move out of are white and over half of them speak English as their mother tongue. This right. is the problem with anecdotal evidence. You lived here. And you weren't even able to give me an accurate summary of this place. And you lived here for how long? Wait, I lived, I lived where? Sorry? In, in Surrey or whatever? In Surrey? Yeah. yeah. How long did you live here for? I grew up there. So you grew up here and you don't even know what this place is like. And yet you're what trying you to tell me you, you grew Wait, up here. Wait, how do, how do I not know what it's like? Because the majority of people here are white. And Wait, over what half are you, what of are you them. That from? I said the Guru Nanak area is 77% Indian. If you look up that, that is a completely accurate statistic. Uh, yes, South Surrey, South, uh, South Surrey and uh, North Surrey are completely different areas. You have a half of Surrey that is a totally white area and the other half that is a totally Indian area. Okay, and over half of the people that live in this entire area speak English as their mother tongue. Yeah, that's the white half. <clears throat> I, and I mean, I'm sure there are absolutely uh, Indians that have integrated and do speak English. 100% and they're they're great assets to Canada but uh, there are a lot that have not integrated and I think that's unfortunate and I don't think they're particularly bad migrants to have they're not violent they're not uh, trying to impose any sort of political laws on us like Sharia I, I think it's unfortunate that a lot of people aren't learning the language and are enclaving themselves off into areas where literally um, different racial groups don't talk to them, don't participate. I mean, you have entire schools that are only one race in these areas that uh, people can't send their kids if they speak English or French, quite frankly. I mean, I think that's unfortunate, but there's certainly not even comparable to the problems you have in Europe at the moment. But when you say problems in Europe, you're talking about a very few specific ghettos in a very spew, few specific countries. You're not talking about Sharia law taking over large swaths of land well, like that's, ISIS that's, or Al Nusra does in Syria. Like, that's the fear for the future. That's the fear for the future. If you look so at the uh, where be... birth rates are going right now, if you look at if you look at the amount of, the amount of children they're having and the uh, if you look at the amount that are coming in in a hundred fifty to hundred years, the very fabric of what. France is specifically. France is a big problem right now. France could change. And countries, Germany, all of these countries uh, that are letting more and more migrants. I mean, I think Britain is going to be pretty okay. I think Croatia and Poland are going to be okay for a bit. I mean, you have a lot of countries that are hungry. They're pushing back hardcore. But a lot of these countries that aren't pushing back, what are they going to look like 50 to 100 years from now with the birth rates at this rate and with their borders open? What that do you mean by what are they not, look like i don't understand what are, you mean are they by going that. are they going to are their cities going to start embracing sharia more are you going to have a well, Muslim isn't that why the goal should that be is isn't well? that why the goal should be integration and not like insulting people and telling that they're subhuman yes. and trying to move them off no into no one is shit? calling no one is calling anyone subhuman and no one is telling people to move into the ghettos i mean okay, first the, of all the these people are ghettoizing of, themselves but the general and, tone okay like when you say things like that like these people are ghettoizing themselves you don't think that there's any when you have an entire um fucking country saying like fuck you we're leaving the eu because we don't want immigrants anymore you don't think that there's a bit of a backlash 
backlash against native populations on all of Europe kind of shifting a little bit to the West. You do realize a lot of the people that were saying, F you, we're leaving because we don't want any more immigrants were people that are, were people of all backgrounds that were like, quite frankly, like, holy crap, we don't want our country over one run with uh, a population of which one, what is it, one seventh or something sympathize with ISIS sorry, we don't want that in our country. Like, I don't think it's bigoted in any sense to say that. What does that even mean? What do you mean sympathy? <sighs> Have you seen the stats for migrants sympathizing with ISIS? It's pretty know, damning. It's pretty low. One out of seven? It would be way higher if One anybody knew where ISIS low? actually came from. Dude, ISIS is <laughs> fucked, man. That whole situation in the Middle East is super fucked. They are, and, and yes, they are ghettoizing themselves. That's just a fact. That's not something that's offensive. That's not something that is... But it's also a fact that there are countries that spend more on integration and have better chance and have better oh, opportunities. So, so it's our duty to integrate them. No, we shouldn't be taking on chores and we shouldn't be babysitting. Your duty as a country, as political leaders, is to help your people, not babysit and pay tons of taxpayer dollars to integrate them. No, when you accept people, they should want to integrate in the first place and should put in their own effort to assimilate themselves. It shouldn't sure, be but our why wouldn't you make babies. that assimilation as easy as possible, as frictionless as possible? It's not supposed to be a fucking triathlon to come into it. Like, if you can bring people here, if yeah, they can... Yeah, we the best. It should be a triathlon. You should have to work your ass off to get in this country because a lot of the people here have a damn good culture and we want to keep that culture. A lot of the people that immigrated from these countries legally, that waited four to five years on a waiting list to get into the country instead of just showing up on showing up on the beaches of Sicily with a Koran in hand. These people that waited, they don't want the populations they escaped from coming to their country okay. and then not assimilating. If so you, you like if you if you like that, if you want to put up all the hurdles and shit, that's fine. But I don't want my country to wither away and die. And it's very strange as a Canadian that you take <laughs> what do you, the mean? you don't you don't want you don't want your country to wither away and die. I think we have the same goal. We just see different uh Ways of okay, helping so then what I do you do with cutting. depressive birth rates around, you know, more I industrialized? You, I just told you earlier, why, why does immigration have to be the solution? Why can't we have foreign workers programs and why can't we help our current populations to have children instead of quite Because they don't want to have children. When people what become they don't want to have children? It costs a fuck ton to have children right no, now. It's not for what? No, people don't have children because they become wealthy and they have better shit to do with their lives than give birth to a fuck ton of kids. And on people all the... Homes in Canada or America right now, it costs so much. They're paying into social systems that are, quite frankly, benefiting immigrant homes. You have refugees, tons of them, actually, that are coming in and have all okay. of their, their whole family. If people their women, are making these... If people, and job and is working. Okay, if people like, are making these decisions to have children because of economic reasons, then why is it always the poorest people in society that have the most children? Why is it, why is it always the poorest people yeah. in society that have the most children? Yeah, because people... A lot of them are uh, immigrants, first of all, and a lot of them get welfare checks from having children in ghettoized areas. Do you, do you have any kids? Do I have any kids? No, I have two hedgehogs, though. If you had the opportunity <laughs> to collect some welfare checks, would you put your body through multiple pregnancies in order to collect them and then have dads walk out and live a shitty fucking life on welfare where you're in some shitty house with no job opportunities and no future available? Do you think this is something that a lot of people desire? No, because I have an IQ over room temperature. Because why? Because you were born to a decently wealthy family and were able to go to a Christian school growing up? I mean, you have you were doing pretty good starting off. Like, you got pretty lucky with, with where you were born, no? Sure, but there's also cultural things there. There's also, Which also like, the you had nothing to do of... with, that you inherited everything of and contributed nothing to. You're still 21 years old, right? So you got okay, really you, lucky. You could all... also, okay, you could also... Okay, it's not just that. Yeah, there, there are tons of things... Okay, religion plays into that okay. big time. Hold on, hold on. People who are no, religious it doesn't. have far no, no. Oh, it everything in the West, everything in the West, all of our progress has come at shunning religion. That's all of most of our success has been <laughs> moving more and more secular. I know you laugh, but that's where all of our social progress comes from, believe it or not, buddy. Right, you're right. Tell me why all of these poor countries Christianity Tell me had nothing to do with the, re uh, the, the West, Renaissance yeah. and all of that shit. All of that was bucking prior ignorant religious thought. And all of the progress we've made socially in the West has tended to be people moving less and less um, towards religion and more and more towards secular ideas. Can you tell me why all of these very um, poor countries and like Africa and shit, why these people have kids so much, even though they don't get the welfare and shit for it? They have kids because they want people to take care of them when uh, like when they get older, because they if they have more kids, they know that some of them are going to survive because they have a chance of half of them dying. That's why they have more kids. Okay, so instead of giving these, like, crazy weird answers, don't you think it might just make more sense? What do you mean that's a sense? crazy weird answer? That's the reason. That's the don't reason Don't you they think it kids. might make a little bit more sense that as people become more wealthy and more educated and get into better financial positions that they just want to have less children? Because that is the general trend of the entire history of the world. 
rather than trying to find, well, these people here are, are just doing it for welfare. And these, when I can give you one general thing that explains the birthing trends of the entire Western world, don't you think like Ocom's Razor kind of demands you to look oh, at that? Oh, wait. Okay, yeah, as they, as they get wealthier, they have less children because they can invest more time in those children rather than uh, having lots of children and hoping that some of them survive and some of them work. It's it's, it's our case selection theory, sure. Sure, yeah, and, and poor people in general have less shit to do and sex is free and shit, so why not? Like, poor people in general uh, across but all also, of... Right now, uh, when you have people that have skills, they're working instead of having kids, uh, which are a lot of the native populations. They have skills. They've gone to university and school like I have. Mm -hmm. So they, they work instead of using kids for welfare because they, like I said, they have skills. And there are things you can do to help native birth rates. For example, what Ivanka Trump wants to do, you could create a tax credit for child care. Right now, you are literally taxing parents in Canada specifically. I, I know my tax law is better than America's, obviously. But in Canada, it costs you more money to be married and have kids. I think it's the same in the States as well. Like, it's not... <laughs> it's it's not a great situation for parents in the West right now. I mean, there's certainly they're subsidizing immigrants more than they are native populations, and I think that's wrong. Do you okay. think that's wrong? Middle class and 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 upper class wealthy people, at least in the United States, I can't speak for Canada because of what you're saying is true. I've never heard anything like this in my life. These people do not make decisions to not have children because of financial reasons. They make really. Decisions Yes. I think of you. Okay, all right. I've never in my life heard somebody who's making 200k a year plus be like, "Well, I don't want to have a child because I can't afford it right well, now." Well, not everyone you... is ha making 200k okay, plus. I'm, so talking I'm talking about, about middle class, person. wealthy. I'm talking middle about middle class. Middle class is 200k plus. I don't know I what is middle class. Well, I don't know what world you're living in. I don't, how, how much does a freaking uh, Starcraft player make? Holy shit! <laughs> like... Okay, what is? <laughs> I... I don't think that people in general, when they talk about families and whatnot, they could probably burden the or, or shoulder the burden in terms of paying for the children. But typically, you want a closer family uh, because you want more opportunities available to you because you are more educated because you know that taking care of a fuck ton of kids is a lot of fucking work. Like usually, education and economic opportunity are things that dictate whether or not you'll have children, not government benefits. I don't think that you can just like your, your argument is initially we just expand certain types of welfare to middle class people. They're going to start having a fuck ton more children. I don't I, I don't think, think that's they true. will have more children if it's easier to have kids. Yes. OK, I, I think people have le I think they say I can only afford one or two kids right now because taxes are too high because I can't afford a bigger house because we quite frankly can't put food in a third mouth. Yeah, I think it has something to play into having kids or not. And when you have immigrants that come in here and they're like, oh, shit, for every kid I have, I can get a fuck ton of money. And my wife doesn't have to work because she's going to be on welfare, too. Let's just have a fuck ton of babies and we can feed them all. It's much harder for if you look at the amount of welfare that immigrants are on versus natives, uh, I definitely suggest you look into the Center for Immigration uh, Studies stats on that. Also, the average income in the U.S. is 45K. You're not going to find a middle class family making 200k. Okay, 200k. So I said little, I said middle and upper class. I said middle meeting. and I said middle and upper class because you're making it sound like you're making it sound like if people just had more money they would have kids, but the wealthiest families seem to have the fewest children. So that, that, that well, Okay, what does that have to do with anything? Well, you said that the reason they're not having kids is because they need more money. Why is it that all these super rich people don't have like 20 person. kids? I'm talking about the average Okay, person. so rich people are fundamentally inhuman or different than middle class people? I, I think rich people are a little different than uh, I I think people that okay. are, so I, think, is, I, I do think they're different. So um, this is my yeah. problem, okay? When, when, I'm, when, when I try to present something, I'm saying that in general, as people become wealthier, they tend to have less children. That is a trend that can be followed every single place in the world, okay? And you're saying that, well, if you give more people or some people more money, sometimes they have more kids in different areas for different reasons. And sometimes, like if wealthy people have a lot of money, well, they don't want to have kids. But once they hit like a lower amount of income, if you give them more money, they'll want to have, like you're, you have so many qualifiers behind your statement. And then you're telling me so, something. So that, we, like, should, we should facilitate people's laziness at the expense of our society. No, it doesn't surviving. have to do with being lazy. Right. Some people just don't like to have kids. It used to be because of religious no, no, reasons largely. About what about immigrants? we should you're saying we should be paying for them and their kids and everyone to come in to keep our society surviving no not generally my argument from the very beginning is that immigration presents a and very also, huge positive for the economy you just have to mitigate the risk so you, 
Sorry, sorry, continue. Sorry. You just have to mitigate the risks. So if we find that there are like really fucked incentives for people having children or whatever, or daisy chain immigration or whatever you want to, you know, whatever thing is causing kids to be born that shouldn't be born, then you would hope to seek, you would seek to limit those things and then you expand on the, ec on the economic positives. You wouldn't just say no immigration, fuck these people. No, no one is saying no immigration. We're saying hawkish immigration policy. We're saying bring in immigration that is beneficial to our society. Don't bring in Syrian refugees. Don't bring in people that are, don't bring in uh, tons of Somalis every year that don't have skills. Like, no, I, I'm totally for it. Bring in tons of immigration within Western society. That's great. Immigration within societies uh, other than Western society that have been screened well. Sure. Sure thing. I'm talking hawkish immigration policy that is only beneficial to the country. Also, back to uh, the rich people thing. Rich people tend to have fewer kids because it takes a long fucking time to get rich. They're different from the rest of people. They also tend to consume more expensive goods like private education for their kids. They're very different from the rest of society. Uh, so rich people often don't want to have kids because they want to put them through Harvard and that's way more expensive. So they'll have one or two kids instead of four or five kids. They're, I don't they're, think they a multimillionaire is worried about having three or four kids because they can't send all of them to well, Harvard. Well, not every, multimillionaires are the exception, right? We're just talking about 200K bracket. Okay, that's, that's a, the very that's a rich. rich. Yeah, that's the very rich person that's going to have less kids. Okay, I can tell you that I don't want to have more kids because I have one and I think that's enough already and I just don't really feel like having any more children because I like the opportunities available to me right now and that there is no government policy that would ever incur, but I guess that's anecdotal. I don't know if that counts or not. I don't know. I think that rich people are like very, very rich people are an entirely different breed of human. Uh, they have a very high standard of living. Uh, they tend to prefer to have few kids because they want them to want for nothing. They're a different mindset of people compared okay, to but your, you know, now you're your average very, very rich kids and kids. want for nothing. So you're saying that if Trump had another kid, his net worth would be closer to mine? Then he would be impoverished if Trump had more children? If Trump had two more kids, it would be the end of the fucking Trump estate? Like, no, I'm not saying that. Then what, what do you mean, like, very rich people want their children to be provided for? You're making it sound like having one kid is going to make a significant difference no, in I just financial think they have a future. higher, they have a very high standard of living. So yeah, but they, the high standard of living they, could they, be shared among it's, it's 50... Our, it's, our, it's our case selection. They tend to invest more in that one child. Like, like hundreds of millions money. of dollars into one child? What? <sighs> okay. All right. What I'm what saying is, is, is at this at a certain level. What is your explanation? What is your explanation when for why people become people wealthier and they have more opportunities available to them? They have other things to do in their lives than raising fucking kids. They don't want to be raising kids all the time. That was sure, some so shit. Your 45, that... So your 45k uh, earners that are the ones having trouble earning money, and they tend to be the more regular, down to earth American family people that just want to have that white picket fence. They're going to be the people that you want to support and help and having kids. Sure, but even a lot of these people are kids. working careers. They want to have successful children. They go to college. Don't also, want to Trump have. Also, Trump has five. Okay. Just... Don't want to have like six, seven, eight, nine, ten fucking. And how many marriages is that through too though? But that you have to take that into account because wasn't he married two or three or four times before? Pardon? Yeah, but he can afford to have as many kids as he wants because he can make them all want for nothing. Well, sure, like... but I'm saying if you're talking about five kids between two parents, there's a difference between that and five kids between six or seven parents. Or that's not possible, but... Okay, but he's, he's very different also. He, even most wealthy people are not billionaires. Sure, but, but also most wealthy people have the fewest number of children. Yeah, people are tweeting me. They're saying poor people tend to be short-sighted. That is why they don't save money properly. Yeah, and that's why they sure. react. And have a ton of fucking kids. They're stupid. Poor people tend to be dumber than fucking wealthy people because of access to education, contraceptives and shit. Right? Yeah, it's a fact of life. Yeah. That's but the, the, like, the 45K people are going to be the ones that are going to be the ones that need help having kids that are going to need help sending those kids to university that are going to not our we shouldn't be bringing in immigrants and subsidizing immigrants so these 45k people have to live in a box in the sky for the rest of their lives okay but never the, being able to have a family again, you're but, being very short-sighted because you're, you're talking about an economic stimulus and you're only looking at the drawback like well, we shouldn't be spending money to support this well what if you spend money to support this and it, what what if there's a guy who's who's makes 45k a year who's getting a raise now because there's so much demand for construction of new housing in an area where immigrants are moving in or there's a guy that works at a company why are you laughing these are very well, real he's probably getting happen. taxed to shit to pay for all that housing that he's building i mean tax to shit <laughs> taxes are a part of life, the immigrants guys. aren't okay because um, the immigrants aren't what uh, they're providing a benefit that's why no, california's no, no, no. economy is very very successful miami isn't a giant fucking shit hole. that is an economy that's very fucking successful that is a lot of hispanic people the whole david card study on the mariella boat people come people over take like 70 percent 70 percent of hispanic immigrants are on some form of welfare i'm sorry but okay, they're but not they... making up for 
what they're taking. Damn. So you disagree with Borjas on that? What, what is, who, is the, who is the economist that you would cite then that says that these Hispanic immigrants have been a net negative on the United States, the most successful economy in the world? And the California... Center for Immigration Studies is who do, I'm do, Okay, I don't care about Centers for Immigration Studies. Of I course want you an, an, No, because these are numbers <laughs> that exist in a vacuum. You do not have a degree in economics or any qualified um, experience in here that can tell me how these figures play out in the real world. This is why I read up on people like David Card and Borjas and all these other economists, because I'm curious what educated people in the field say. Not what raw numbers about 27.4 percent of people are consuming this much uh, welfare like okay well what how does that actually play out if, if economics were that simple you wouldn't be able to get phds in the field okay you would learn here, about it in how, grade school here, and then come out knowing everything there is to know about economics here's how it plays out in the real world that guy who is about to be building the houses for those migrants that's uh going to be making money so he can have his kids has his job taken away by an immigrant because he can do it cheaper that's how it plays out in the real world okay or what about the guy that wants to start a construction <laughs> company and has a great idea and a lot of capital for it but he can't find workers but now a whole bunch of mexicans moved in and he's got a bunch of people i mean he can't find work workers work. there are plenty of people that want to work in the united states right now i think our unemployment is falling at five percent or lower if you drive around in my city anecdotal but there's a fuck ton of places hiring or what if you want to move to another city and hire cool. people foreign to work? workers Foreign workers program. Why do you, how are you going to import foreign workers of the United States? I'm about to fly these people over. What the fuck? Yes, that's what we do in Canada to pick our berries. Why would in fact, I? When I was in when I was in high school, I applied to do berry picking as a job, and I didn't get it because a bunch of fucking people that were foreign <laughs> workers programs got it. Why would I, I want to have? Why wouldn't I want to grow my country at the same time? Why wouldn't I want to grow my economy, bring these people in, make them Americans, have them have children, become Americans, contribute to the tax base instead of making them foreign workers where they ship their paycheck off and leave at the end of the year? Why wouldn't I want to grow my country and grow my entire economy at the same time? Why would I want to only do foreign workers? Because when you're bringing in those, you, suddenly you are getting the workers that you need to make up for the uh, population that you don't have, and you're not having to pay 70% of them uh, some form of welfare. And also an uh, increase in crime, which does happen from a lot of specifically... An increase uh, in crime may or may not happen. In the United States, which is what I'm more right. familiar with than Europe, there have not been any conclusive studies linking that like, oh, immigration is definitely causing crime in areas that I, I looked for them and I tried to find them. because. Oh, I, here's, I, here's another study, uh, if you want, on this um, from the Heritage Foundation, the fiscal cost of unlawful immigrants and amnesty to the U.S. taxpayer. You can look at that one. I unfortunately have to go in about five minutes here. Uh, I'm sorry, I would love to do this debate longer, but what, what do you want to finish on for our last kind of topic? I, I Let's do something fun instead of uh, yelling at each other over immigration. <laughs> I mean, we could yell for the for the moral views and shit that you have, I think, in the fifth or sixth chapter in your book. But I mean, the moral views. Other... Yeah. The, right. I, I, yeah the I watched your debate with Screlly. That looked fun. Yeah, it wasn't really a debate. It was a two hour. Yeah, you guys had a little more bands. Yeah. All right. Last five minutes. What do you want to do? What do you want to talk about? Um, what's your favorite anime? What's my favorite anime? Oh, God. Uh, man, I haven't watched anime in a long time. I used to watch a lot of it when I was younger. I really liked, um... So you had the, that, you posted that very lewd picture in your anime leggings on Twitter, and you don't actually okay. follow any anime at all. I swear to God, I swear to God that is the seam in the pants, and I'm pretty mad <laughs> about that. Okay, yeah. Um, no, 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 I used to watch anime when I was younger. A lot of it. So you're I, a I fake, like you're actually, you're I, I a, a fake, fake girl fake. anime fan. You only pretend to fake. like anime to get all the anime fans to back you. You're not even a real girl fan of anime. Hmm. Yes, you know, I watch anime every day. That's what I do. I sit down and I just read my mangas when I come home from work. Okay. No, no All right. I don't watch anime. On a, on, a, pants. on a more serious note, okay, all I want is for conversations to take place in the realm of reality. When you're dealing with things like immigration, there are positives that I wish I could get your side to admit that it does grow the economy, that you do have more opportunities available. You do grow the GDP and the slice of the pie and even the GDP per capita for everybody, that these are all things that can happen. And there are also negatives. Sometimes people don't want to assimilate. Um, sometimes people form ghettos. Sometimes people um, hurt workers of the same class when they're migrating um, or immigrating or whatever to the economy, right? These are things that government policy needs to control for, right? You need to try to limit the bads and then make it so that the goods, you, you know, show as much as possible. Now, Borjas himself details ways to do that. These are the kinds of conversations that I want to see happening. I want to see somebody like you or Alex Jones or the Young Turks get on and talk about, like, I don't know what the best way is. Um, you know, how are we supposed to mitigate? Maybe we need to tax businesses that are paying lower wages more for retraining jobs on people that lost jobs. Remember, like, maybe the, if these kinds of conversations were happening, I would absolutely love it. Not the conversations of 
every refugee that comes is a rapist that wants to go into no, a No, no one is saying that. No okay, but saying. your statements were getting pretty close to like all of these immigrants are saying coming. Saying a lot of them are. And they, a lot, <laughs> right? Which is an unqualified wish. A lot, of them, wish. Prob- a lot prob- of them want to unclave themselves and, and then cause countries to become majority Sharia law. If these people love Sharia law and shit so much, they'd probably stay in their own fucking countries. They wouldn't be going to Western countries. But, that, but that, that's my, that, I'm sorry, so. no, I'm, not trying, I'm not trying to argue, I'm sorry. That was just my spiel that I wish the conversations were rooted more in, into making progress than just demagoguery on both sides. That's that's my ending thing, and then you can end on your. Okay, I think I think anyone would be stupid to say my side is all one hundred percent right, and there are no points on the other side that have any merit at all. I mean, I think that's, I mean, I, I think that is just as stupid as it is to be a radical centrist having sex with your brain and saying. <laughs> Dog, oh, I'm not trying oh, to interrupt you, but you literally, literally yeah, yeah, wrote yeah, yeah. in your book on three reasons how immigration fails on every single point at the start of that chapter. Yeah, well, I think we have extra. I think our problems are very, very. I think we have more problems with immigration than benefits right now, and that's why I'm saying how immigration is screwing us right now. That is what my book points out. Anyways, I think you continue to uh, just, just to a quick point to Borjas. You keep mm-hmm. misquoting him. I think you need to read more of Borjas' stuff. Uh, his main point is that the flow of immigration benefits some people, but it does not flow to domestic workers. Those benefits do not flow to domestic workers. That is Borjas. Anyone watching can go ahead and read him. Um, but yeah, I would end on, I, I agree with you on the point that there can be benefits to immigration. I'm not going to sit here and say that all immigrants are evil. All immigrants uh, are all trying to create Sharia zones. All immigrants are low IQ and don't help the country at all. No, there are certainly immigrants that do benefit the country. There are certainly immigrants that have value to add. But in order to find those immigrants and in order to ensure that you are getting those immigrants, you need to have a hawkish immigration policy and you need to ensure that the amount of immigrants you are letting in are not at a rate that they are creating enclaves and not at a rate that they are unable to assimilate to the current culture of the country. That is has is and has been my point for a long time. And I do will say I do appreciate uh, you having me on to talk about this. I find sometimes... Uh, a lot of people on the left and on the right uh, avoid debate, avoid talking. They're scared of it. They're scared of conversation. So even though we were yelling at each other, I think it's cool that this was able to happen at all <laughs> instead of just muting each other. Yeah, sure. I agree. All right. Well, listen, I appreciate you coming on. It's been fun. Listen. Absolutely. You're young and fresh. Please don't grow into another Ann Coulter. Don't do that to yourself, okay? <sighs> Ending on patronizing. You're, not, not you're better look, than dude. that, dude. Don't do it. You're I saw your that. book. I saw that Ann Coulter wrote a fucking thing. I see the <laughs> way you're postured in there. Don't do it, okay? You'll yeah. If you go to heaven, if you believe in that shit, you'll look down and you'll... Trust me, it'll be a bad ombre, okay, dude? Bad ombre. I think I'll be just fine on my own. I think I've got my own personality, and I think I will do fine without that advice. <laughs> but right. I appreciate you having me on. All right. Have fun, buddy. Cheers. Okay. Fuck. I, I got drawn into the culture shit too much. He excuse me said it would happen, and it happened. I don't think I could get her to concede a, seri- a single point on the economic part. Um, I'm sorry, real fast, just while we're all here and it's fresh in our mind. She said that I kept misquoting Borjas. Borjas was the, the economist, because I thought we were going to talk about the economic side of this more, was the economist that I read on a lot. So let me just read this article by um, Borjas. Borjas himself, okay, that was written very recently, okay, in October, only a few months ago, okay? I've been studying, okay, so remember, if you remember at the beginning of my thing, my point was that I wanted people on the left and the right to admit that both sides have, um, have valid criticisms of one another and that we should meet in the middle and discuss policy that addresses the pros of immigration and the, and the cons of immigration. That's, that was my central point, okay? That is not a unique point to me. I literally copy-pasted this from Borjas, okay? I've been studying immigration for 30 years, but 2016, uh, Borjas is a Harvard immigration professor, or a Harvard professor at um, what school? Fuck, at their school of, I should know, but I don't remember. Um, But 2016 was the first time my research was cited in a convention speech. When he accepted his party's nomination in July, Donald Trump used one of my economic papers to back up his plan to crack down on immigrants and build a physical wall. Decades of record immigration have produced lower wages and higher unemployment for our citizens, especially for African-American and Latino workers, he told the cheering crowd. But he was telling only half the story. Hillary Clinton, for her part, seemed to be telling only the other half. At her convention a week later, Clinton claimed that immigrants, both legal and illegal, improve the economy for everyone. She told the crowd, I believe that when we have, let's see if I can do Hillary voice. 
I believe that when we have millions of hardworking immigrants contributing to our economy, it would be self-defeating and inhuman to try to kick them out. That's how Hillary talks, right? Comprehensive immigration reform will grow our economy. Here's the problem with the current immigration debate. Neither side is revealing the whole picture. Trump might cite my work, but he overlooks my findings that the influx of immigrants can potentially be a net good for the nation, increasing the total wealth of the population. Clinton ignores the hard truth that not everyone benefits when immigrants arrive. For many Americans, the influx of immigrants hurts their prospects. This second message might be hard for many Americans to process, but anyone who tells you that immigration doesn't have any negative effects doesn't understand how it really works. When the supply of workers goes up, the price that firms have to pay to hire workers goes down. Wage trends over the past half century suggest that a 10% increase in the number of workers with a particular set of skills probably lowers the wage of that group by at least 3%. Even after the economy is fully adjusted, those skill groups that received the most immigrants will still offer lower pay relative to those that received fewer immigrants. Both low and high skilled natives are affected by the influx of immigrants. But because a disproportionate percentage of immigrants have few skills, it is low-skilled American workers, including many blacks and Hispanics, who have suffered most from this wage dip. The monetary loss is sizable. The typical high school dropout earns about $25,000 annually. According to census data, immigrants admitted in the past two decades lacking a high school diploma have increased the size of the low-skilled workforce by roughly 25%. As a result, the earnings of this particularly vulnerable group dropped by between $800 and $1,500 each year. We don't need to rely on complex statistical calculations to see the harm being done to some workers. Simply look at how employers have reacted. A decade ago, Crider Inc., a chicken processing plant in Georgia, was raided by immigration agents, and 75% of its workforce vanished over a single weekend. Shortly after, Crider placed an ad in the local newspaper announcing job openings at higher wages. Similarly, the flood of recent news reports on abuse of the H-1B visa program shows that firms will quickly dismiss their current tech workforce when they find cheaper immigrant workers. But that's only one side of the story. Somebody's lower wage is always somebody else's higher profit. In this case, immigration redistributes wealth from those who compete with immigrants to those who use immigrants, from the employee to the employer. This is supply-side economics. And the additional profits are so large that the economic pie accruing to all natives actually grows. I estimate the current immigration surplus, the net increase in the total wealth of the native population, to be about $50 billion annually. But behind that calculation is a much larger shift from one group of Americans to another. The total wealth redistribution from the native losers to the native winners is enormous, roughly half a trillion dollars a year. Immigrants, too, gain substantially. Their total earnings far exceed what their income would have been had they not migrated. When we look at the overall value of immigration, there's one more complicating factor. Immigrants receive government assistance at higher rates than natives. The higher cost of all the services provided to immigrants and the lower taxes they pay because they have lower earnings inevitably implies that on a year-to-year -year basis, immigration creates a fiscal hole of at least $50 billion, a burden that falls on the native population. What does it all add up to? The fiscal burden offsets the gain from the $50 billion immigration surplus, so it's not too far-fetched to conclude that immigration has barely affected the total wealth of natives at all. Instead, it has changed how the pie is split. With the losers, the workers who compete with immigrants, many of those being low-skilled Americans, sending a roughly $500 billion check annually to the winners. Those winners are primarily their employers, and the immigrants themselves come out ahead too. Put bluntly, immigration turns out to be yet another income redistribution program. Once we understand immigration, this way, it's clear why the issues split Americans, with many low-skilled native workers are taking one side and why immigrants and businesses are taking another. Our immigration policy, any immigration policy, is ultimately not just a statement about how much we care about immigrants, but how much we care about one particular group of natives over another. Is there a potential immigration policy that considers the well-being of all Native Americans? Maybe so. It's not a ban on immigrants or even on low-skilled immigrants. High-skilled immigration really can make America wealthier. The steady influx of legal immigrants also produces more taxpayers who can assist financially as the native population ages. Then there's the matter of principle. Many Americans feel that it is a good thing to, judicial, to judici judiciously give some of your tired, your poor, your huddled masses a chance. But we're worrying about the wrong things, with policy fights focused on how many and which immigrants to accept, and not enough on how to mitigate the harm they create along the way. To use a label recently coined by Larry Summers, 
A responsible nationalist policy cannot ignore the reality that immigration has made some natives poorer. A policy that keeps them in mind might tax the agricultural and service companies that benefit so much from low-skilled immigrants and use the money to compensate low-skilled Americans for their losses and to help them transition to new jobs and occupations. Right? This is essentially what I was saying, right? Similarly, Bill Gates claims that Microsoft creates four jobs for every H-1B visa granted. If true, firms like Microsoft should be willing to pay many thousands of dollars for each of these coveted visas. Those funds could be used to compensate and retrain effective natives in the high-tech industry. But let's not be naive. Policy fights over immigration have often been fierce, taking decades to get resolved. To even partially compensate those Americans who lose from the current policy would require massive new government programs to supervise a massive wealth redistribution, redistribution totaling tens of billions of dollars. The employers that profit from the way things are going are, are won't go along with tra those transfers without an epic political struggle. And many of the libertarians who obsessively advocate for open borders, borders will surely balk at such a huge expansion of government. To make this work, Clinton and her supporters will have to acknowledge that our current immigration policy has indeed left some Americans behind, and Trump and his supporters will have to acknowledge that a well-designed immigration plan can be beneficial, and this is all probably not going to, or all this is probably not going to happen, but only then can we have a real debate over immigration policy. <sighs> this is, um, yeah, this was like the point that I was trying to get across. This Borjas guy is the leading guy on the right that advocates for a more sane immigration policy. This is the guy that people cite when they talk about problems with immigration. So this is like the most extreme educated person that advocates for this. And his positions seem very reasonable, right? Like, ah. <sighs> When you read these word for word, I personally don't get much out of it, and I imagine most people don't either. You'd be better taking these articles to read and having highlights, notes, etc. beforehand and just reading the key points, how it related to your debate, explaining it instead of going through it verbatim. Wait, really? Summarize that shit. Um, so does that mean immigrants are bad? Wait, did we really, did we really, not, uh, did we really not follow this? Oh, yeah, this is the school, the Harvard Kennedy School. That guy is wrong verbatim at best. All right, I will unpan and ban I will unban you if you can send me an email of at least a four-year econ degree before you start contradicting one of the most respected and most sourced by the right economists, like in terms of dealing with this issue. Like, why don't you explain it like I'm five? Okay, so let me summarize what my argument was, um, and then I'll summarize what he's saying. Well, it's more or less the same thing. I copied my position from this guy. <laughs> um, so. The problem is, okay, I'm going to use the United States as an example, okay? The problem is that immigration is a thing, okay? Oh, sorry, fuck. Um, the problem is that immigration is a thing that has pros and cons. The left seems to look at it, and it refuses to acknowledge any of the cons. The right looks at it and seems to refuse to acknowledge any of the pros. So you're in this strange world where you have people like, I guess, the Young Turks or whatever, saying that we should let in unlimited immigrants and everybody benefits and nobody gets hurt. And you've got people on the right, like Lauren Southern, saying things like, um, or I guess she seemed to come more to the middle at the end, I think. Um, although, damn, she wouldn't give me a single point. Holy fuck. Um, Moving to the right, you have a lot of people saying things like, we need to dramatically cut off immigration, we need to focus on our own people, we need to close our borders, um, isolationist policy, um, immigrants are ruining the economy and the culture, blah, 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 right? So it seems like you, you need to find a stance in the middle where you acknowledge that immigration can do good things. For instance, people can immigrate to your country, they can make it so that different people are able to pay lower wages and they can compete more on products um, to make it so that you can buy things for cheaper at stores, right? And, and the immigrants that come in will have their own demands for housing and, and food and supermarkets and all this stuff on the, the economy, right? And then businesses will be more profitable because they can pay less wages, right? These are all pros, right? You want this, right? You want lower prices for goods. Yes, that's a pro. You want um, greater demand in the economy. That's a pro. You want... Um, I think you want a greater supply of labor because if you believe that um, supply will ultimately dictate the direction of your economy, so you want a greater supply of labor. That's true. Um, lower. Pr what did I? What did we say? Lower prices. Um, businesses being more profitable. Um, growing your overall economy. Right. These are all good things. Right. However. Um, on the con side, on the con side, there are people that are disproportionately impacted by tons of workers. Um, low skill workers that come in. Um, so Borjas did a big review on David Card's um, groundbreaking immigration study into Miami um, of the supply shock of the Mariella boat people that came from Cuba. 
Um, Borjas's claim is that <clears throat> people who exist in the same economic bracket as immigrants, when you get a large amount of immigrants coming over that are competing with these people, will experience depressed wages, right? Um, so you need to do something. That is a negative, right? You don't want your natives to get fucked by more competition. So you need to enact some kind of government policy. Also, people that come over um, will more often take advantage of government welfare and government spending, right? So you need an economic policy that helps the people that are most hurt by these types of trade policies and immigration policies. And then you need an, uh, and an economic policy to redistribute maybe some of the wealth away from the businesses that are gaining so much from immigration to help the people that are hurting the most from it, right? Does that make sense? That's Destiny, a criticism of Borjas is that he manipulated the data on that study. It's a complex debate on that specific issue. Yeah, no, 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 I know. I, I read because um, Card and Pied or Fied um, did a re um, did a rething. Um, where they re they did a rebuttal to Borjas saying that he handpicked his numbers too much, but then Borjas did his own re rebuttal where he republished. I, I read every uh, or no, I read the big David Card thing, and then I read the Borjas thing, and then I saw the um, abstracts of the rebuttals. But going into data picking at that level is something I'm not. I can't read what they're saying and pick out who's right or wrong. I don't have the education to do that on whose data selection is superior. Um, oh, Perry is that the name? Perry Perry. I don't know how to pronounce his name, but yeah, yeah. Um, Basically, um, a guy named David Card, along, do you want me to explain this? Does anybody care? I don't know if anybody cares about these studies. Um, one of the big problems when you study labor markets is that it's impossible to do experiments, right? Economics is a soft science for this reason, right? You can't like set up hardcore experiments like what happens when this happens? What hap Because you have, because economics is so complicated, right? Um, and, and, and so many things can happen on a macro level, right? For instance, 500 immigrants come into an area, right? Well, what's going to happen? Obviously, you're going to lose a lot in uh, wages, right? Exactly. That's what's going to happen, right? Well, maybe not. 500 immigrants come in. Maybe businesses in the surrounding area start to open new factories here or open new shops here, knowing that they can take advantage of that newly present labor. Um, maybe when they open those shops to take advantage of that labor, you get other natives that are able to move into supervisory positions that are actually better off as a result of those people, right? That's a lot of what was going on in California. That was the big economic study that I read on California because they get a lot of Hispanic workers where a lot of native wages in different groups were actually helped because they were fitting, um, they were starting to fill in complementary positions is what they're called to a lot of their, right? So, but, but not always, right? I'm not saying that that will always happen. I'm just saying that it's really, really, really complicated. Um, so David Card, a long time ago, was able to do a groundbreaking study on the, um, on the study of how a massive supply shock to labor will impact a particular market. Because in the, in oh God, I should know this. Was it 1965, 75, or 85? It was one of the fives. I want to say 1985. Um, I should just look at, um, David Card, is it 1985? The, it's the Mary, uh, Mariel Boatlift. Um, Fuck, dude, I don't remember the year. I'm really bad at my years. I'm not going to lie. Is it, it was a 1990 study, and the Mariel Boatlift was in 1980, I think. So basically what happened was this was one of the times when um, – this was one of the times where Fidel said, um, get the fuck out of my country. I don't, if you want to leave, I don't give a fuck, right? Fidel said that. And I think like 100,000 people, it was like 50,000 plus people all left um, Cuba and then they went to Miami, right? So what you got was a, an awesome opportunity to study, okay, well, what happens when you get a supply shock of labor to workers in an area? We, now we can actually study it because it's literally like if we were playing The Sims, we just dropped, you know, 50 plus thousand um, hi, hi, uh, no high school education level workers into an economy and now let's see what happens. And David Carr did a massive study um, where his final conclusion was that because other businesses moved in, because complementary positions opened, more or less there was no harm to any groups of people really in, in, um, in Miami. And this landmark study has guided a lot of economic policy from governments around the world for a long time. Borjas did a revision of it where Borjas said that David Carr's selection of who was hurt was bad and that when David Borjas re um, got like razor focused on certain groups of people, um, I think namely he said high school dropouts um, of a certain age, he was saying that these laborers had experienced a depression in wages if you focused on them. But then David Card and um, Pire, I, I remember the name, fuck, this guy's name, um, came back and said that Borjas's data selection was bad and then he was being disingenuous and cherry picking. And then Borjas came back and gave an argument for his cherry picking and why he picked what he did. And I, I don't, it's, it gets very complicated when, when you when PhD level economists are arguing with each other. I can't make sense of who's right or wrong, right? I just have to see who comes out at the end alive, I guess. <laughs> Um, yeah, but that's essentially like all of those memes. So, so again, like 
this is a very okay so i'm responding to comments in chat now this is a very one-dimensional view of immigration that you don't even believe in but you're saying it i think because it's been repeated to you the economic argument depends on which immigrants you're talking about sure 100,000 plus salary engineers and doctors are great for the economy unemployed not so much why don't we just let in hundreds of thousands of engineers and doctors and no one else because the engineers and doctors that live in your country don't want that dude look at all of the people now you're getting because for the first time in history i think you're running into areas where now high skilled laborers are starting to lose their jobs to competition to h1b visa um, imports from uh, india this isn't something good you don't want to bring in a hundred thousand doctors because all of the doctors in your country are going to be ass pained as fuck when their wages are depressed through the through the roof through the floor i guess depressed like Destiny, do you agree or disagree that lower cost production is not necessarily a benefit depending on the environment surrounding the decrease in a goods price? For example, the price of a bar of chocolate could be going down at a gross price per bar level, but the chocolate could be worse. The bar can be smaller and the cost outcome could be higher due to inflation and income segment. Sure, there's a lot of things to keep in mind, right? I always wrestled about quite a bit of her comments about visiting Europe and talking about it with people. I should have read more on that, dude. Every time I try to dig into the ghetto shit on... on, on in, in Europe, it, there seems like there's so much bullshit involved that I just didn't bother. I should have dug into it more, especially knowing that she was going to play the culture card. That was my bad, dude. I should have went into it more or not gotten sidetracked, I guess, is hard there. H-1B has not hurt immigrants. Um, yeah, there's, that's my bad, dude. Um, somebody linked me a study. Oh, fuck, what was it? Sa claiming that, but I have to read it, and I don't know if everybody believes it or not. I have a hard time believing that, but... It, that might not be true. Maybe I've read too much of the Borjas guy, but I have a hard time believing that when there are lots of people getting laid off as a result of H-1B workers coming in, that there hasn't been an impact on, on the, the, the wages paid to that part of the labor market. I could, I could be wrong. I fully admit I could be wrong. But, my, but now that I have my, my inner Borjas compass, <laughs> it doesn't feel right to me. Pretty much all of what she said about Germany was bullshit. Yeah, and like, I didn't want to bring up, like, I mean, I've been to Germany. How many times have I been to Germany? I mean, I, you guys would know more than me. It's over five times. Has it been over ten times? How many Home Story Cups and, um, what did I go to? I am, uh, Leipzig? Like, I've been to Germany a ton of times, and I usually talk politics when I go there. You can ask take or whatever, and I've never heard this, like, immigrants are ruining everything. Even in the little bumfuck town I go to in Dusseldorf, or not Dusseldorf, it's the airport, um, Krefeld, um, right? Like, I don't hear all these things about, or all these things about immigrants destroying everything and blah, blah, blah. Like, I've never heard this from any of the Germans that I've talked to before. And, I, and I've even talked to Germans that have traveled around a little bit more, too, like TLO and um, that writer dude from Team Liquid that lives there. Um, yeah, I don't know, but but I never cite that personally because I don't think that's relevant. I would never cite like my anecdotal conversations with a few people because I think that that's like really, I don't know. I really don't like that. I think that that's a really bad argument. Maybe I maybe I took too much math in in in, in high school and it makes me feel bad that I feel like that's like a slaughtering of everything that statistics has come to stand for for you to talk about. Um, you have a good background for this position, but you have to start calling people out on their obviously garbage slash incorrect points. Ask them to prove it. Otherwise, they leave the debate still thinking those immigrant, most immigrants are rapists. Um, did I mention that less than 1% of crimes with the refugees coming into Germany were... How can you possibly know all the stats for debate like this? Like, some things that I know to be true, I'm pretty sure that refugees in general commit less crimes than the average German population, but I don't know, like, the breakdown of that. Like, I feel like the burden on knowing every single stat there is too much. So when she starts saying that, like, well, and, you know, like, these guys from this particular place come over, it's like, fuck, like, I don't know, that might be true. Like, damn, am I supposed to know every single breakdown? <laughs> Should it be, like, court where we submit the evidence beforehand? She should have to take an intro to stats course before saying anything in public ever again. Well, a lot of people have bad understandings of stats. I think stats should be taught in high school as a mandatory class, or at least statistical interpretation. You'd be surprised at how many people um, will say things like, uh, like, oh, a study of 1,000 people? That's got to be a horrible study, right? Like, I can't imagine. Like, I would kill myself every time. If I had to work in, like, the medical field as, like, somebody working, uh, like, uh, like doing these uh, fucking grant work and shit in universities, like, do you know how painful it is for people like that who struggle to get like, um, to, cause when you're doing medical trials and shit, right? Like you're starting off with like, what? Like a fucking dozen applicants if you're lucky for some of these early things. But like over like a dozen or two dozen or three dozen people, you can get some very good information, right? It's very, 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 very rare, exceedingly rare that you'll have, um, that you'll get researchers doing medical studies involving like thousands of people. These are massive studies that are not the norm, right? But people are very quick when you're like, well, here's a medical study, blah, 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 blah. And you're like, this study had 84 people, dude. 84 people that doesn't mean anything well no <laughs> that's not how that works like that's a very good it's a very strong starting point you know you need to make these debates like an academic discussion oh having like fact entire 
Uh, that's why official debates have an entire team of fact checkers. The problem is that for some people, like, and this is one of the things you run into where your um, where your cognitive biases play against you so hard. And Aaron can talk about this. Some people, their anecdotes are everything, dude. You should listen to my aunt, who's a, who was an NYPD cop for 40, 42 years, forty five years, retired. Um, I'll never be able to convince her of anything because she's seen so much shit anecdotally that nothing I say will ever change her mind about anything. Like, anecdotes fuck with your mind so hard. Like, you can see one thing, and that will shade your impression of something for the rest of your fucking life, dude, right? How many people have you known that have traveled abroad that will say something like, um, oh, dude, like, I went to France there. Dude, that place is a shell. I hated it so bad. I was like, damn, what happened? When I went into this restaurant, these two guys harassed me or whatever. Like, this is horrible. I was like, oh, shit. So your one experience colored your whole perception of that country? You've been there one time? Right? How many people do you hear make statements about this, like places they've traveled to, right? Your cognitive biases are absolutely working against you when you're trying to understand large amounts of data, large amounts of data about a large population of people, right? Like, you can't let a single anecdotal evidence go through when you debate a feels debater. But people believe in it. But, the, but that's the problem. Like, I feel like with some of these debates, you have to spend like 20 minutes talking about good scientific methodology that like anecdotes are just totally not valid. You just, they're totally bogus. You can't do it at all.